Today's Liberty Conference game is being brought to you by Apple Bank for Savings. We're good for you. Cable Vision Sports presents Liberty Conference Football. Today, Pace will try to topple St. John's from atop the Liberty standings. These two pass-oriented teams should light up the skies over the Redmond's new Omni-Turf field. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Wolf. With me is Emerson Boozer. We're, I guess we're christening the field here, the new on the turf field. I would say we are. It's a brand breaking new field. I don't particularly like the synthetic turf. Being a running back, uh, you kind of get used to being down on the ground, and you want it to be as comfortable as possible. <laughs> You've been on a lot of fields, uh, Emerson, running and uh, hitting the turf at times, too. Well, these teams, I'd say, are pretty evenly matched. Let's take a look at the, the comparisons and, and see how the statistics hold up against them. Emerson? We look at uh, the, the Merchant Marine Academy. They're atop at 3-2-1. Uh, uh, then you've got Patterson, 25-3-0. Uh, Pace uh, winning over Stony Brook, 26-22. And then uh, losing a tough one opening day. Uh, losing the post 31-6. And I'll tell you, those fellows can, well, they pass the ball a lot, and that's what they'll be relying on today, a lot of putting that ball up in the air. Points for, points against, you can see, well, uh, they've given up quite a few. Looking at uh, St. John's, they took uh, their opener over Iona, and then losing one up, uh, to Wagner, and Marist 29-21, uh, winning that one, and last week, 38-7 over the Fordham Rams. Mm -hmm. Now, Going into this game, St. John's is the only undefeated team in the Liberty Conference. But if Pace should topple them today, it'll be a, a three-way tie for first. And here's how the, the teams compare in some of the offense and defense the statistics. Emerson? This is a big matchup today. You see uh, St. John's being 3-1 and one in the Liberty Conference, Pace 2-2. Two and two. Now, a win today by Pace could even things up a bit, 3-2, and two, tying, giving uh, them a tie with the Redmond or first place along with uh, the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, last week... We had an opportunity here in our Cablevision Game of the Week to take a look at Paul Costa, who can really throw that ball. In fact, last year and last week, he set all sorts of uh, records for St. John's. The most passes thrown, the most passes completed. And here you see another one of those completions. 30 for 48, 443 yards, four TDs. Costa can throw, can he? Indeed he can. I was very impressed with him last week. Uh, he showed all the, the kind of poise you like to see with his quarterback. He missed it, mixed his passing uh, passing attack up. Uh, he liked his big tight end a lot, uh, Weisenberger. He also found O'Connell a lot. Absolutely. He scored a couple of touchdowns in last week's game against Fordham. Now, on the other side, well, Pace knows they've got to do a job in the secondary, and they've got number four, Doug Beeling, and, and he can intercept the passes. <laughs> but he was burned last year because St. John's, actually last year, as we take a look at, at Beeling and doing his job right there, a very fine back, last year they put Barbary, a six-foot-eight player against Beeling, and he towered over Beeling, and he scored the touchdown, which placed them within a point, and then a pass from Tony to Tony Sass to set up the, the two points, which won the game 15-14. to 14. So we can watch Beeling because he's out for revenge. And also, when you take a look at the uh, great passing of Kevin Edeline, who was setting all sorts of records for Pace, he'd be looking for number one. That's Rich Johnson. Rich Johnson is the speed burner for Pace. He'll be off to the left of your uh, screen here. You see the number one there going down, making a spectacular catch. We check again here. He's the man for Pace that gets all the big yardage. So keep your eyes on number one because he'll be very much in evidence this afternoon. He's a very fine receiver. In fact, Pace is fine receiver. St. John's has them. So I expect that they'll be filling the airs with footballs. Well, we'll get more from that from the coaches. They're standing by it now with, with Frank Curtali. But first, let us tell you that you're watching Liberty Conference football here on Cablevision. is your free checking. You're looking at checking that's really free. That's right. Here at Apple Bank, there are no check charges and no monthly fees, nothing. Plus, you get five and a quarter percent interest on any balance over $700. So come in and get the free checking that you and your money deserve. Apple Bank for savings. We're good for you. Some days I'm so busy reading the defense, I don't have time for my morning paper. 
But when I can't read all about it, I hear all about it. WCBS News Radio 88. Managing in the Big Apple doesn't leave me much time to read the morning paper. Well, Sweet Lou has got a sweet solution. When I can't read all about it, I hear all about it. WCBS News Radio 88. We may say wear English leather or wear nothing at all, but there's no law that says you can't do both. Genevieve's Drugs has rousing savings on great gift ideas for that cheerleader in your life. 1.5 ounce heaven sent spray cologne on sale for just $5.99. One ounce loves baby soft spray cologne only $6.19. And 1.5 ounce loves body mist for just $5.69. Great savings at Genevieve's Drugs. Frank Rotella here on the sidelines with Coach Bob Bricker of St. John's and defensive coordinator Bob Baker of Pace University. Bob, Bob, this week's game, uh, pivotal game, all games are big. But uh, if you win this game, you're right in the log jam, right there for two and one, first place with St. John's and Merchant Marine Academy. Well, this is our first real big one in two years. You know, the kids are real, are real excited over this, and uh, it's something that we've worked for, and you know, it gives us a good chance to turn around our program and you know, be a little bit of a force in the Liberty Conference this year. Kevin Airline's shoulder a bit hurting. How is he today? Uh, Kevin didn't really throw till Thursday. He's pretty good today. If, if, any, if there's any problem, it might be a little bit of timing with his receivers. He didn't really get too much time with them all week, but he's throwing real well right now. Is it true now that one of your uh, linebackers, Dan McKenna, has a new nickname he acquired last week? Tell us a bit about that. Well, uh, Tom Whalen, who writes for the Gannett Westchester newspapers, uh, watched uh, Danny play offensive back last week on a goal line for us. And uh, after the ball game, talked to him a little bit, and he came up with the nickname, the Irish Ice Chest. And uh, Danny kind of likes it. He's, uh, yeah, he's excited about it. And uh, kids are kind of kidding him all week, but he, uh, he likes having a nickname. He's leading Russia now for Pace. Two, two touchdowns, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Uh, okay, last, last year's game, they came up to Pace. They beat you 15-14. Was that talked about much this week in practice? Well, we haven't got anybody on the team that's ever beaten St. John's. And uh, they know it. You know, they've talked about it. You know, they realize it. And, uh, two close games the last two years, and uh, you know, we'd like this one to be ours. Coach, good luck to you today. Thanks a lot. Okay. On my right is Bob Bricka of St. John's. Bob, uh, last week about this time, you weren't, feeling, you weren't feeling too happy, a bit down because of uh, field wasn't ready, had to be a late minute switch at Fordham, but all in all, things worked out. Won three out of four on the road so far. Actually, Frank, you can't get uh, too upset about things you can't control. We're just uh, very uh, excited the way things worked out for us last week. A big win up there at Fordham, and we're just very, very happy and delighted to be here at our beautiful new facility. Paul Coster had great protection from the offensive line last week. He's probably going to need it again. Uh, pace coming in, their defense averaging four and a half sacks a game. Uh, Rich Middlebrook and company, and uh, obviously uh, we're planning a few things that, uh, to try to help protect Paul again today. Okay, and Coach, uh, good luck today. Best of luck to the team, and uh, go out and get them. Thank you, Frank. Okay. Bob Ricca and uh, Bob Baker, the coaches, today's game. So there you have it, flying footballs everywhere when Bob and Emerson return. With the call of today's game, you're watching Liberty Conference Football on Cablevision. Sullivan County Community College, a great start that never ends. A two-year SUNY with day and night classes, great career choices while you're making new friends. Communication, photography, a restaurant management and media arts, undeclared major, computer science, food service management, commercial art, sports, movies, concert and dance for a great social life and maybe romance. Sullivan County Community College, a place for fun, a place for knowledge. Sullivan County Community College, a place for fun, a place for knowledge. Jerry, costs are going up and up as far as college education is concerned. How's Apple Bank trying to help defray some of those costs? We understand what's happening to educational costs, Barry, and at Apple Bank, we've devised a student loan program that helps the family budget. How can people find out about this program? All they need to do is to visit any one of our branches or call the student loan hotline number. Apple Bank for Savings, with five convenient locations on Long Island. Here we go now at the start of the game. Don Issa will be kicking off for Pace. St. John's won the toss they'll receive. Finn is the deep man. And the brand new field, the ribbon has been officially cut by Jack Kaiser, the athletic director of St. John's. So we're all set to go, and the Omni turf just looks magnificent. Nobody has yet made the first kick, the first run, the first pass. And that'll all be history now in just a matter of seconds as we get set for the start of play. 
Dan Issa does the kickoffs, field goals, extra points, and the punts. He does all the booting for, for the pace setters. And right now, as we get set, with the ball being held, as you can see, in the field, we're getting set for the boot, which will get things underway officially. And there it is. It's a high one. It's going down, taken at the uh, eight-yard line. The returner is Finn. And Finn is filled as he approaches the 30 at the 28-yard line as Matt Riker comes in to make the stop. So it's first and 10 for the Redmen as the game gets on the way. And Paul Coster, who had the best passing day in St. John's football history, will be there directing the team. He wears number 15 for the Redmen. By the way, there are many injuries. Brian Williams, the great tailback for the uh, St. John's Redmen, is out of action. Sprained his knee against Fordham. Er Emil Hill is in his spot. Christopher Finn also seeing a lot of action this afternoon as John Casenza is also on the injured list with torn ligaments in his ankle. And on the first play, it's Amale Hill moving off that left side, picking up just four yards in the play before Dan McKenna comes up to make the uh, stop. McKenna, by the way, 5'11", 225-pound sophomore, wears number 44 as we take a look now at the lineups for both teams. Pace we're taking a look at right now first. We look at their defensive alignments. Dan McKenna making that stop. And he leads the team in tackles. So he'll be watching a lot of number 44 defensively as we now have a second and about seven yards to go. The ball resting at the 32-yard line in St. John's territory. This time, Costa looking for a receiver, throws over the middle, and it's Weisenberger, the intended receiver. The pass a little behind him. He was clubbed, closely guarded by Dan McKenna once again, and that ball fell incomplete. There you see uh, McKenna getting into play. Last week, Weisenberger became the favorite target uh, for Costa. And you see today when he wants to throw the football, his opening receiver, he was looking for number 89. Weisenberger would cover very well by the setters. And we'll be seeing a lot of Weisenberger. Very fine uh, receiver. So here we go now with the next down coming up. Third down, still seven to go. The ball at the 32. Again, Costa. This time looks and fires, intercepted. And so the Pace University team with Peter Frank, number 34, brings that ball almost back to midfield as Pace takes over. Peter Frank. That was a mix-up that time, Bob, by uh, Coster. He was looking downfield. Either the receiver didn't pull up as he should have, but anyway, the ball was thrown down directly to Peter Frank. Let's watch it again here and see if we can see what uh, Coster sees. He throws down deep center, and expecting a receiver to be there, uh, the receiver either be getting there late or didn't run the correct pattern, but Frank didn't care. He's got an interception. So that gives the pace setters an opportunity now. They're led by Kevin Enteline against William Patterson in the uh, home opener, 30 to 25 loss. As we take a look at the pace lineups, Enteline, whom you'll see flash up there at the the quarterback slot, threw a school record 57 passes, completed 24 for 317 yards and three touchdowns. So like Coster, he'll put that ball up in the air. In fact, he needs just 208 yards to set a pace single season passing record. What happened to all those running backs like you, Emerson? I think they're all uh, <laughs> probably home watching the Mets today. <laughs> okay, here we go now. And look at this spread formation with the single back behind the quarterback and, and three wideouts and a man in motion right now as pace is certainly looking like they're going to the air right away. And in the flat, so there's Marchetti, and oh, was that diagnosed. Augie Marchetti, number 20, spilled as Collins came in there, along with Lou Monty, number 35, to make the first tackle of the ball game, and that brought about a loss of seven yards in the play at second and 17. Ball's back at the 41. One thing that we'll see a lot of, and that is Pace, likes to make those passes in the flat. And with that little protection back there with three wideouts like that, Emerson, there's not much chance to throw a long pass if you get a rush on, is there? No, there isn't. Normally at clubs, when they are behind or in trouble, you go with a spread attack, they'll blitz you a lot. Bob? Okay, here we go now with the man in motion this time. That's Mark Satter. Number three is in motion. And they're looking for Saturn, but they throw short. And Saturn has the ball. So Mark Satter made a little button hook around there. He was in good position before Mike Maddich came up to hit him quickly. So watch for that short passing attack. Well, here's the replay, Emerson Boozer. Again, this is what we call a wiggle or a waggle or a half roll to the left. And uh, 
You see Endelai moves outside. He finds uh, Saturn sitting into the pocket somewhat, an open spot, and makes the completion. With all those receivers out, and you can see right now they're still staying with the same formation, it gives them a good opportunity for those quick ins, just very quick passes. Not too much time to get off the long one. And this time again, they go toward the sidelines, but overthrown, intended for Dan Rena, number 85, who's the big end. Rena from Valhalla, New York, is a 6'2 junior. Closely guarded on that play as Ken Hagriliak was going along with him, stride for stride. Bob, make note of that last play, seeing the line roll to his right trying to uh, hit a receiver out there. We'll see that pattern again because the receiver was open and the ball was just overthrown. And here we have Dan Issa's graphic. He's the, the specialist in kicking the pace. He does all the booting. And we're getting set now is Tony Sass, who is a lone safety, gets set. This is a fourth and 17 play coming up. So the, the boot is a high one angling toward the sidelines and it goes out of bounds. Went out of bounds to the 21-yard line, and the Redmen will take over there. No score. We're in the first quarter of play here at Redmond Field. Bob Wolf, Emerson Boozer, and Frank Totale is our sideline man. And here's the series record. St. John's leading 5-3 last season. St. John's won 15-14. to And we mentioned that game in the pregame show. Pace was winning with a little over five minutes to go in the fourth quarter. They decided to go for height, like their basketball counterparts. Through a high pass to Barberi in the end zone, he gathered it in. That put St. John's behind by one, and then Coster to Tony Sass for a two-point conversion, and they won out, and that spoiled Pace's homecoming last year. Oh, look at this hole. A beautiful thrust through the middle. And that play was taken by Christopher Finn as he moved across the 30 to the 31-yard line. Good gain on that play before Neil Morgenstern came in to stop. Morgenstern also an outstanding defensive man for Pace. He's a 205-pounder from Fort Lee, New Jersey, and an academic All-American. What happened there, Bob, is that uh, the setters got caught in a blitz. Uh, they are a very active defense, so they'll, they'll stunt and they'll run the blitz at you all day. But that time, they got caught coming in as the back went out. That takes up a first down, the ball at the 31-yard line. Operating right now out of the, the St. John's T formation with a wide out on the left and a split receiver on the right and a quick pass slanting over the middle off the hands of Sass, who reached up and up all the slithered away. Brian Conboy was there to guard him, but it was a pass that ordinarily Sass would haul in. Tony Sass. He's a senior, Bayside, New York. And by the way, he was the fellow we told you about. It caught, as we take a look at Bob Rick in his ninth year, who caught that the winning two-pointer last year against the, the pace setters at pace. We noticed that time uh, on the pass outside to Sass, uh, Conboy slipped down. Unfortunately, the ball, he did not catch the ball. Sass did not hold on. Had he held on, that would have been a big game. And now we have the, the two setbacks and a wide out on the left and a split end on the right and a quick pass to Sass. Not much yardage that time. Sass was slanting in toward the middle, and again, it was Conboy who was there to Make sure he didn't get any additional yardage on the play. So that pickup is about six yards. As we take a look at George Mayer, who is the uh, coach of the Pace team, has been for some years, you can see, 14 years. Look at that record, 70, 44, and three. Mm -hmm. Well, they have some excellent coaches in this Liberty Football Conference. Of course, they play uh, games outside the conference as well, but this conference has really stirred up activity in our area with excellent results. And here's a little pass off to the left as Finn is the recipient. And he picks up uh, not close to a first down. He's short by a couple of yards. But almost looked like a screen starting. But there wasn't much protection in front of him, was there, Emerson? No, there wasn't. It was a screen pass with only one lead blocker. The lead blocker did what he could do. And that left Finn by himself getting outside. So that means the uh, punting unit comes in. And Mark Kowal is in to do the, the booting. 5'8 sophomore from Bridgewater, New Jersey. And deep is Doug Beeling, whom we spoke about in our pregame show. Beautiful spiral. Oh, Beeling goes back and takes it in on the 20. And here's Beeling back just covers the ball. Looks like Pace may have recovered, though, on that play. Coming in quickly was Jerry Insall to make the tackle as Matt Riker was the one who burrowed in there to, to come up with the ball. So that saves possession for the Pace setters. Just look, look at the replay. Look at it again here. Mike Riker, uh, Matt Riker is an outstanding special teamer. As we see Beeling losing the football, here comes number 39, Matt Riker recovering. So Pace now takes over the ball and 
on this first play right here. We moved the ball a couple of uh, steps forward, but there's no huddle on the play, sort of a trick play. Looks like it took the element of surprise, but not too much of it. That's, that's what they call a, the quick start. Got to get in and get out in a hurry. This time the pitch out and the movement by Rob Farron back. And once again, St. John's is ready for him. St. John's very alert in defense. And Mike Argenti is the first one that comes in and make the stop. Argenti, by the way, was our Apple Bank Defensive Player of the Week uh, last week with eight tackles and a quarterback sack. And he was very much in evidence. Boy, that was knocked down. Fehrenbach was over there along with Casenza on the play, and Fehrenbach was the one that was reaching for the ball along with Rena. What do you think about this series of set plays like this that we're seeing, Emerson? Usually this kind of series will start in the, either just before the half or at the close of the ball game, the last two to three minutes. It's what they call the hurry-up offense, designed to... Uh, uh, strike fast in a hurry and hopefully wearing the opposition down. Well, that time St. John's was not taken by surprise, were they? The kick, rather a short one, although high in the air by Issa, and his sass, he gathers it in the 33, slips down, but gets and goes forward five more yards. He is called, considered down at the 37-yard uh, line. Ray Minogue was in there defensively on the stop, and so St. John's takes over in a 0-0 game. Ten minutes to go here in this first quarter and a few seconds. The ball at the 37-yard uh, line. St. John's in possession. Sass is now wide to the left. Coster in the uh, quarterback slot with two setbacks and a, a flanker on the right-hand side. Pace maneuvering as Weisenberger now moves down the middle, and Weisenberger has the pass thrown behind him. He was guarded by Neil Morgenstern. That again right there, the pace setters a very active team. They were coming with the blitz, and they caused uh, Costa to throw the ball a little bit sooner than he wanted to. St. John's overall record, three wins, one loss. No ties. Pace is 2-2-0. Two, two oh. This is their overall information as far as their record in and out of the Liberty Conference is concerned. But in the Liberty Conference, St. John's is the lone undefeated team. Once again, wide to the left, we have Tony Sass. And here's a little thrust off to the right side to Manny Casantis. He gets his first opportunity and moves to the 46-yard line before he's brought down by McKenna and Frank. It's going to be very close to the first down, all depending on the spot by the officials. Manny Casantis, number 33, a very speedy freshman from Port Jefferson, Port Jefferson Station. 5'10", 170-pounder, but he is really quick. And if you look toward the sideline, it's third, and I'd say less than a yard to go, but close enough, so we may have a look from the uh, chain gang. They're coming in now, I believe. Here are the officials. Well, these are the gentlemen that you're taking a look at this afternoon who are in charge of the ball game. And right now, they have just beckoned to bring out the chains and make sure whether or not that is or is not a first down. So a little stretching of the, the chain. It's going to be close, but they miss it just by that foot and a half, two feet. So the ball right now remains at the 46, where it's third and about a foot, foot and a half to go. And this ball is in St. John's territory at the moment. Well, how does that Omni turf look to you so far? You've seen them uh, cut, run, pass. Uh, any indication, Emerson? Uh, it's a good-looking feel. I saw the the sand that they've uh, put on it, uh, hoping to prevent slippage, I would say. But so far, I've seen two people slip already. Uh, first first being Convoy uh, on, a, on a slant in passing pattern. He lost his footing. Fortunately for him, the receiver didn't catch the football. Secondly, I saw number 81, Tony Sass, on a quick post lose his footing. Now with the third and one, we're back into the eye. Once again, we have a wide out on the left and one on the right as Costa calls signals. Let's see whether he tries to pick it up himself. No, he'll go for a quick slant over the middle, short. It was intended that time for Tony Sass. Well, that sort of surprised me right there. They had third and a, a little over a foot to go on the pass. And we have a, a sideline player. Here's Anthony Casenza, who is on the sidelines right now, being, being looked at. Mark Kowal is getting set to boot. 
and a fair catcher signal for and taken by Doug Beeling. That surprise you that pass call there with the third and a little over a foot to go? Well, no, it didn't. Uh, the the slant pattern that uh, Costa tried to hit that last time has been open all day to sand. It's just that Costa did not get the ball up. He threw it into the ground the last two times. So it's a question in your mind of execution, not the strategy, right? And that is it. <laughs> okay, Emerson, I go with you. This gives Pace the ball now. We're under 10 minutes to go in the quarter. And Pace University, St. John, so far, nobody has rung up any points on the uh, scoreboard. Down the middle, and a line. Oh, that was close to being intercepted. Coming up this time was uh, Brian Norton. Pass intended for Johnson, and that was overthrown, or else you might have seen the, the ball move in the opposite direction. You know, was, go ahead. We're, we're looking for both quarterbacks to throw the football, and they have thrown it, but uh, here in the early goings, they are not connecting as well. Ball in the 26, where it's second and 10. The 26 of Pace University. Rich Johnson is spread wide to the right this time. Just beside him, we have another wide out on that right side as well. Once again, on that passing formation. And this time, the rush is on. Will he get free? He's, he's considered dead. So the whistle was blown this time as Patrick Dunnigan was the first one to lead the charge of the, the red men in against Pace University. Kevin Edeline, 5'11", 180-pound senior from Walter Panis High School. Here's Frank Catali at the sidelines. Yeah, Bob, uh, I just checked over with uh, Anthony Casenza. As you know, his brother broke his leg last week. He's out for the year. Anthony is, uh, according to Ron LaFonte, the trainer, he says it looks like he has a mildly sprained knee. They're going to check it out more at halftime. But right now, he's uh, walking under his own power, limping a quite a bit, just a little bit. And uh, back upstairs, Bob. Okay, and that's a good indication that he is up limping. Boy, it's been a, a tough football season for the for these two fellows, has it not, the Casenzas? Indeed it has. Uh, that last week injury uh, to the Red, Redmond's club uh, hurt uh, awfully bad. But uh, we hope that it's nothing serious to uh, Anthony because uh, he will be sorely missed. And John last week, uh, well, he was outstanding before he went out. In fact, he game before that, he caught nine passes uh, from a fullback position. So uh, he is sorely missed. He's a, as a fine athlete as is his brother. Down coming up right now. Third down, yards to go, 11. Pace University with the ball, no score. And a line. Oh, thrown in heavy traffic. And we've got a flag on the play as well. Intended for Rob Fearenbach, and he was pretty well covered. Darren Pohornick was among those who were in there covering for the Redmen. That was sort of a risky pass. There was a flag on the play. Here's Emerson. With all the red bo red bodies around, and one orange or yellow uh, figure that has to be passed at appearance as we see uh, the call being made, interference against the Redmen. So that's the, oh, here's one of our casualties from last week as well. And that uh, is the casualty, John Casenza, who uh, had that torn ligament in his ankle last week. With all the injuries uh, the Redmen had last week, they had good news this week. Uh, they reversed the decision not to keep out Wayne Hartshaw, and he had been declared uh, out for the season, but he's back this, this week. Well, that's good. I'm glad his recovery was so quick. Phil Capra, number 33, the ball carrier that time. They need big yardage, though. So Capra picked up a couple of yards. It'll be a second down coming up and eight to go. John Krieg was in for the tackle this time. Second. The pace started off with a little strategy here. Getting their plays off very quickly. St. John's responded. Pace now has gone back to their normal routine, utilizing the, the single back and the two wide outs. And a line. And the pass is short. This time it was thrown for Rich Pogey. Mike Maddox was there to do the defending on the play as Rich Pogey was out. Good to see Pogey back in action as we look at the coach, George Mayer. Pogey last year was occupying the spotting position up here in our booth over at Pace, by the way, because he was out with an injury. And Mark Ridge, who was out with an injury, is now taking his, his spot up here on one side. And John Balcom, who is the PR, Sports Information Director of Pace, is on the other. Uh, Edeline getting set on the uh, passing slot. 
on the shotgun and the pass to Johnson in and out of his hands. Here in the early goings, you would think that the ball players will have loosened a bit here, but uh, we've seen several drop passes this afternoon, even though uh, Johnson is sure headed. Normally, he, he just dropped that one. Uh, clearly in the open, ball thrown a bit back to his right, but he turned around, was able to get both hands on him, just uh, couldn't hold on to the football. He's a good receiver, too. He caught nine passes last week against C.W. Post. So here we go in the punt formation with Dan Issa getting set to boot. And the deep man is Tony Sass. This is an end-over-end -end kick as Sass gathers it in on the 22. And comes back just a few yards before Ray Minogue, number 80, is there to pit him down very quickly. Frank Vitale is on the sidelines. Frank, what's happening down there? Well, Bob, so you want to know what OmniTurf is. Here's basic uh, explanation what it is. This is the rubber pad that goes underneath the green surface you see here. This is the uh, actual OmniTurf surface. But what you have here is the sand that's put within the fibers to keep the fibers standing up. Now, Emerson, you don't like the artificial surfaces. Well, what the difference between the OmniTurf and the artificial turf is that here, if you watch my foot, when you press down, you press down on the OmniTurf, you have the give, a little bit better shock absorption. That's what's supposed to cause less injuries. Bob? Okay. Thank you, Frank. And that was Christopher Finn running over that uh, OmniTurf as uh, Frank was giving that fine explanation. So Christopher Finn picked up yardage on that play. And he picked up enough yardage to come up with a first down for the Redmen, who now have the ball at their own 38-yard line. 38 first and 10 for St. John's. Seven minutes and a few seconds to go in the first quarter. No score. Rather hazy skies overhead, but a very mild afternoon operating out of the tee. Now Costa this time looks and fires, completes it to James Weisenberger. Don Dignan was there to defend for the pace defense. Now that may be getting to look like uh, a passing attack as you see Costa come back to his favorite target, Weisenberger. Watch him uh, come out, play action here to his right, and you'll see number 56, Don Dignan, come up and uh, do the defending against Weisenberger. He's open a good two or three steps. It's second and four to go. In the Liberty Conference, these two teams really dominate the statistics, passing Costa's number one and Edeline's number three. They didn't pick up the first down that time. Middlebrook was in there to stop Finn. In receiving, Johnson of Pace is number one. Weisenberger for St. John's is number two. So Johnson of Pace is first. Weisenberger of St. John's second. And Fehrenbach of Pace is third in receiving. Sass of St. John's is sixth. In kick returns, Beeling paces the, the Liberty Conference. He's from Pace. And Williams, who was injured, great player for St. John's, is in number two. He's out today. Punt returns, Beeling third, Sass is fifth. And I'm punting, Cole of St. John's second, and Issa of Pace is fifth. So the Liberty Conference dominated by the stats of these two teams. Third down coming up, Weisenberger in motion. The incomplete pass intended for Tony Sass, guarded by Doug Beeling, who is a 5'9 senior from Norwalk, Connecticut. We have a flag down. It appears as though it is going to be holding, possibly, and I, I shouldn't be uh, premature with this. We'll wait and see the call. And foul. It's against the Redmen. One of the, one of the uh, Redmen are getting a little anxious. Uh, that kind of pass, your roll passes, are designed to keep the pressure away from the from a quarterback, somewhat of a moving pocket, and allow him more time to get downfield, either run or pass with a football. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, it looks like they've elected to, to take the play as the Red Men are getting set to boot. It'll be fourth down coming up. Now, let's see what they plan to do. That's what they'll do. So Pace has decided to take the play instead of the penalty, and here we go. Boy, it's blocked. Colo's part is blocked. Tony Lucci was there to go on the ball, but regardless, it still would have changed possession in that play because it was a fourth down play. It looked to be number 58. Pat, Pat Fawcett, Fawcett 
Pat Gary Fawcett. Block, and you see him on the sideline going wild. So Pat Fawcett blocked it, and that moves the ball over now to Pace University as they take the ball on the 40 on the 39 yard line of the St. John's Redmen. First break of the day goes to the pace setters. So let's see what they can do with it, Bob. And now we have a timeout. We'll be back with more action in just a moment. You're watching Liberty Conference Football on Cablevision. Here's a free pass to our next game. Thanks, Barry. And here's something free for you, a free Apple Bank checking account. Free? Absolutely free. No monthly maintenance charges, no per check charges, nothing. I can write all the checks I want at no cost. The only charge you'll get is out of Apple Bank's fine service. And we'll pay you five and a quarter percent interest on balances of $700 or more. Apple Bank for savings. We're good for you. I'm Joe Vittoria. I'm on the board of trustees of Malloy College. I'm also the president of Avis. I believe the professionals of tomorrow will come from colleges like Malloy, where high standards and small classes allow teachers to give each student the attention they deserve. Because in today's competitive world, it's the quality of education that counts. That's why I'm a supporter of Malloy College. I know they try harder. Here we go now, back to more action. After we saw Fawcett come in on that uh, block right that time, the ball goes over to Pace University, who's a fourth down play. And so Pace takes over. Now they're in St. John's territory, and the ball is on the, the St. John's 39-yard line. And this is Pace's most opportune scoring opportunity right now in this early going of the ball game. A little over five minutes to go, first quarter. Quick open of that time as the handoff very quickly to Augie Marchetti, number 20. He's a 5'7 junior from Brooklyn, New York. So there's Marchetti tailback and the pace offense as he came up that time with a short gain of two yards and now Marchetti moves out of the lineup number 20 it's second and eighth the ball is at the 37 yard line of St. John St. John's using a, a four man line and there's a quick tackle as Rob Ferenbach couldn't get by Patrick Dunnigan so Ferenbach, whereas number seven was spilled, the junior from Wonton, New York. Something is happening up front in the, in the offensive line. You see Coach Mayer look on. Uh, number 73, uh, Pat Dunnigan, he's made the last two tackles, so somebody is getting whipped up front. Mm -hmm. Once again, that ball just barely moved forward. It's third and seven to go. Ball remaining at the 37 of the Redmen. This time we have wide outs from both sides. Antolin looking, throws down the middle, and it is no good. Johnson was over there, number one, and Dan Rena, number 85, was also cutting in the direction of the ball. A lot of Redmen surrounding him. Brian Norton was the first one who went in, but we've got a flag on the play. So the consultation is going on right now with that third and seven play, and it's against pace on the hold. You want, to, you want to see your defense take the play, but uh, with a ball at the 39 or 40-yard line, you are, you're almost uh, uh, forced to take the penalty. So Pace is moving back as they will have to huddle after the penalty is taken, and that moves the ball back now to the 47-yard the line of the Redmen. <laughs> But of course, the play comes up again. It's now third and big yardage. Third and 18 to go. The ball at the 47 yard line. At this time, we're operating, as you can see, out of the, the shotgun. Everybody else is spread wide across the field. And there's a long one down the sideline, and it is. Intercepted, a fine play by number 45, John Krogh, intended for Rob Fehrenbach, who was going along the sidelines, but Krogh was right with him, stride for stride, and there you see number 45, who intercepted the ball. Here's a replay, and he gets congratulations coming off. Emerson? Here, here's a play where in line, he knows that the receiver is covered, but uh, he's trying to just force the action, get something happening down, 
downfield and he just throws to Fehrenbach. You can see, as you can see, three guys there in line saw the same thing, trying to get lucky. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously he wasn't. And that's what Paul Costa has done as far as the touchdown passes go. So he, he can come up with the big ones. He's got a long way to go right now. The ball is back there at the 10-yard line where it's first and 10 for fumble. And it looks like St. John's Costa has recovered his own fumble that time. Boy, that would have hurt the Redmen severely if that one had squirted away. And the pace defense has not allowed a touchdown pass in the last three quarters. Well, something may have to give along those two stats with Costa in the past defensive pace. That's quite a shootout you got. You got uh, uh, eight TD passes and uh, a number of games. And, uh, defense that hasn't allowed one. Uh, that's a pretty good matchup, I'd say. And it's soon to be nine quarters. We have 316 to go in this first one here in St. John's Redmond Field on the new Omni Turf. Oh, look at this hole. Manny DeSantis, and he just squirted off that left side, number 33, with that big hole as he picked up huge yardage. Now, did he pick up a first down? Well, Very the left close to, to it. See, see the blitz coming here. See the block there by number 68, opening up a big cavity here for the runner to go into. That's a cat and mouse game. I would, I would say that uh, Costa had a checkoff at the line of scrimmage to get that one going. Mm -hmm. That's close to a first down. It's third and one, and the ball just over the 20-yard line. Wide out on the left and on the right. Wide receiver on the right side in the eye. Oh, who is the ball? It is Pace. Pace picks up the ball. And picking up the ball that time Peter was Frank. Peter Frank, number 34. Good-looking play, good-looking fumble, good-looking recovery. Right now, advantage goes to the setters, and let's see what can happen. Uh, what, what caused this penalty here? It looks as though Chris Penn goes over. The quarterback and the halfback never made connection, never quite meshed. And uh, uh, Costa handing the ball off, ball hit the hip of Chris Penn. And we see uh, Peter Frank recovering. Big and, break for the setters. And how Neil Morgan sure made that hard tackle, the number 12, to jar the ball loose. The ball is right now on the 16-yard line of the Red Men. This is Augie Marchetti. And Marchetti plows his way forward, getting to the 12-yard line before he is finally stopped by Jerry Insel. That was a big play and a hard tackle by Morgan Stern setting up Frank with that fumble. So that makes it a second and five to go. The ball's at the 12. Pace University with the ball. And a line from Walter Panis High School. Comes from Peekskill, New York at the quarterback slot. This time they use a slot on the right. Oh, down goes Marchetti. He was hit hard by Dunnigan, who again was the, the strength of that inside. Argenti was also in on the play. That makes it a, a third and still five to go as the changes are made by George Mayer and the Pace University team. And now we have Johnson, Saturn, and Fehrenbach. All have moved in. So these are the big passes who are in there right now. Third and five. Let's see what happens. In motion is Saturn, number three on the right side. And they're looking for him. And they're throwing down the middle. It is complete. That time it was Rob Fahrenbach who managed to get free, number seven, among three defenders of the St. John's Redmen. Not enough. That's a first down. It, uh, he Let's was see. back beyond the first down marker, but the ball was caught well, well beyond the first down marker. And the officials have already indicated that it's first down. As we watch again here, uh, watch the line as he uh, got most of his receivers off to his right, rolling right. Finds Fehrenbach, number seven. And at that point, Rob, he has the first down, and he's pulled back beyond the marker. But they mark it a first down, so it's first and goal to go at the six-yard line. First and goal to go at the sixth. Marchetti. And Marchetti is toppled as he gets to the five and thrown back slightly there. Let's see where they mark the ball down. Just over the five-yard line. Toppled that time by Argenti. So it'll be second, and they move the ball at the five. It's second and goal to go for the setters of Pace University. Now, we have a little conference going on on the sidelines. 
time call, just an official's call just for the moment as a check is being given of something on the side with the second showing just 19 seconds to go in this quarter. May have just double checked the time over there, but it's second down coming up, goal to go. With 19 seconds showing on the scoreboard clock and the clock now ticking. Edeline getting set for an important play. Second and goal at the five. Edeline goes back, rolls out, keeps the ball, cuts in, misses the goal line, and he's knocked out of bounds along with the ball, which falls out of his hand. And the scoreboard clock shows that time has run out. That was a bit of a gamble by Edeline. Uh, even though he gave a good fake, good call, I would say it was, but it did not uh, catch the Redman off guard as, as was expected. The scoreboard clock shows all zeros right now, but we have not had... Now we get the indication that the quarter has come to an end. We'll be back for the second quarter in just a minute. First, a reminder, you're watching Liberty Conference football on Cablevision. Getty has been bridging the gap between the quality gasoline America wants and the price they're willing to pay for it. Getty, more miles for your money. The Coca-Cola NIT Classic kicks off the 86-87 basketball season in November. A glamorous 16-team field includes powerhouses Notre Dame, Michigan, Oklahoma, Bradley, Western Kentucky, Villanova, Virginia, Memphis State, and LSU. The semifinals and finals are played at Madison Square Garden beginning November 28th. A new champion to be crowned Saturday night, November 29th at the Garden. Ticket prices range from 10 to 14.50 and are available. Here we go now. It's third down and goal to go. Just a couple of yards away. Dan McKenna, the Irish ice chest. He's called in the backfield. McKenna has the ball. McKenna slants in. He is short of the goal, but he is barely up to it. Dan McKenna, and McKenna, by the way, is the, the pace version of the refrigerator, a small refrigerator, number 44, but this is usually the middle linebacker. In fact, he was the 1985 Liberty Conference Rookie of the Year, but now he goes into fullback for plays close to the goal line. The you first quarter stats are up there, as you can see them. You call it? You call Dan McKenna the ice chest, but I think last week he was dubbed uh, the uh, ice chest. That's right. That's what he is, a, a small refrigerator, Emerson. Now, we're pressed up very close to that goal line. A first down, a goal, to, a fourth down, and a yard to go. Fourth and a yard to go. That ball just, well, actually less than a yard away from that goal line. So this is the key play coming up. Whether or not they'll go to McKenna again, we'll have to see. McKenna, 5'11", 225-pound sophomore from Thurn Ward, New York, went to Westlake High School. Now for the Redmen, they make a change. They put Lou Monte, number 35, in defensively. So here we go with this fourth down play, fourth and one for Pace. This is a big one coming up right now for the Pace set is fourth and goal to go to start here of the second quarter of play. St. John's is held. Augie Marchetti tried to dive over, and St. John's held as Mike Argenti was the first one to meet him on the play, along with Mike Maddich. Maddich, number 58, we see coming to the sidelines. And here's a replay as Pace failed to put it in. Watch the two guys here, 44-39, Riker and uh, McKenna, and Augie trying to come over the top. And it looks as though he really should have been a little bit tighter to his two lead blockers because they give uh, a nice little cavity inside, and uh, Augie just coming in, t tightening up, 
did not get over the top. Well, a great bit of defensive work. And St. John's Redmond held right there in the shadow of their goal line in the end zone. Right now, just trying to move it out just a bit as Koster with the ball. Eric Williams is in to make the stop. And Chris Livingston is also in there. The offensive unit led by Paul Costa has to be very pleased with the way the Redmond defense held up under that uh, goal line stand because uh, turning the ball over inside their own 30-yard uh, line, uh, they're fortunate not to have uh, been behind at this point by at least three points and a possible six or seven points. That ball right now, resting just a few yards from the goal. It's on the second, on the two-yard line. St. John's. This time lined up with wide men on the left side as Costa throws a long one downfield, overthrown that time, intended for Andy O'Connell, guarded by Doug Dealing. O'Connell had two touchdown passes last week against Fordham. He, by the way, there you see him, a transfer from Fordham. He caught two touchdowns the previous year for Fordham against St. John. So he's caught two scoring passes for either one of those two teams. O'Connell had an outstanding day just last week, uh, uh, coming out of the backfield and uh, in the passing game. It's third and nine to go, the ball remaining at the uh, two-yard line. St. John's in the backfield as they get set. Christopher Finn just off to the, uh, the left side. Now that's Finn taking a movement just to his right, number 22. In motion is Weisenberger. And so far, it looks like Costa just trying to move the ball a little further away to give his punter some more room. And that's exactly what he was trying to do, uh, giving more room, but hopes, uh, more importantly, of getting the first down. And it looks as though for a moment there that he might have enough running room to get the first down. So back to the, uh, the punt we go. Mark Kowal standing deep in the end zone. Doug Beeling is the deep man. And there's a high snap. Oh, almost blocked. Beeling gathers it in on the 40. Here's Beeling still with the ball. And Beeling goes down as he approaches the 26-yard line. Again, the centers have the ball at uh, great field position, now resting somewhere around the 26-yard line. Excellent field position. Uh, but uh, at this point here, I can't fault the setters for, not, for going for the touchdown before, but here they must come away with at least three points. Steve Hanke almost blocked that kick for Pace University as he came in quickly. And that pass in the flat to Johnson is no good. That's one of the uh, favorite pass routes that they have, as Johnson likes to move out on the flat. This time, as you saw, he's pretty well guarded. So it brings up a second down. Brian Norton was over there to guard in the play. It's second and 10, and the ball remains at the 26 in Redmen territory. With the second quarter barely underway, and there's no score in the ball game. If you're watching on the Omniturf field at St. John's, Liberty Conference football game. Bob Wolf, Emerson Boozer, and Frank Catali on the field. Oh, look at this open. Fahrenbach. Big room for Fahrenbach. He's still with the ball. Look at Fahrenbach go toward the goal line. He's finally driven out of bounds. Inside the 10 yard line, as Rob Fahrenbach found a big opener, skirted toward the sideline, and picked up the yardage. Finally driven out of bounds by Bob Nealon. Once again, this is what we call an inside reverse. Seat number seven, uh, Rob Fahrenbach come in. Off to the left of your screen, number three, Mark Saturn throws a key block. Here it, come, here it is coming right here. Bing! That gives, uh, uh, that gives Fahrenbach the chance to turn the corner and get the, the extra yard. It's outstanding play by receiver. It was. Good pursuit by Nealon. So it's a first and goal to go at the seven-yard line. First and goal at the seven. Once again, Pace University pressing the Redmen back. Last time they would get there, the Redmen hold. Off the left side is Augie Marchetti. Not too much room there for Marchetti. Stopped finally by Norton, who's been very conspicuous with his defense today. Also standing very strong and tall on that uh, defensive end, number 54, Jerry Insull. He piled things up, creating a log jam and not letting that hole open the way they wanted to be. The ball for six. It's second down and goal to go once again for Pace. Their second big scoring opportunity in a matter of minutes. They had pressed right up against the uh, one-yard line previously. Now on the rollout, there's a pass in the end zone. Incomplete. Tended for Dan Rena. 
And the uh, tight end, uh, Junior from Valhalla, the ball was overthrown. So once again, the Redmen have stiffened their defense. Seems they get tougher the further they press back. It's ball to six, it's third and goal. Again, uh, pressure got to Mr. Interline. He had uh, uh, Dan Reno open just to overthrow it just a little bit. Third and goal from the six yard line. This time we have the double set. We have wide outs on the right side. A man in motion is Saturn. And the throw is complete for a touchdown. Fair and back. There is a penalty on the play. We'll wait and see whether it's against the Redmen or the Setters. But I would take a gamble and say that it was against the uh, Redmen. And you can tell by the roar from Pace University down there that it was against the Redmen as the touchdown play came up. So Rob Fahrenbach with the score on the pass. And now we're going for the extra point. Issa and Poggi does the holding. OG number 41 holding. Issa doing the booting. Low snap. It's kicked anyhow. It is oh. hit the post. No good. It was amazing to even get that one up in the air. And it came that close to going over. Didn't have enough wind in its sail to get over the crossbar and uh, hit just the front of it, bouncing back into the end zone. Isn't that something? <laughs> I was amazed they got that kick off at all. Here's a replay that come up the touchdown, a pass to Fahrenbach. Emerson? And look at it again here as uh, Interline comes out. Uh, watch his steps. One, two, three, four. Now he starts to roll, finds the uh, arena, delivers the ball, in for the score. Let's take a, another look at this. A different angle of it here with Augie out in front. I'd call him Rena, but that was number seven, Fahrenbach, coming in for the six-pointer. So and that was it. There's Rob there. Rob Fernback, a good-looking fella. Got to be awfully happy coming up with the touchdown. And that was a six-yard pass to Fernback from Edeline. The kick failed, as you saw. Five plays, 26 yards and 53 seconds. And Edeline's eighth touchdown pass. And that ties Doug Woodward's record at pace for the most touchdown passes in one season. So in the battle of the quarterbacks, Edeline draws first blood. Now we're getting set for the boot. Issa will kick. Finn is deep. And here's the kick. It's short. Way up in the air, but very short. And it's gathered in on the 18-yard line. Steve Hankey coming up that time for the uh, reception for the uh, tackle as James Weisenberg brought it back very short yardage. Now here's Frank Gertali. Frank. Bob, yes, yeah, so far on uh, St. John's opening uh, opening game today, the Redmen have had a punt blocked. They fumbled the ball. They've thrown an interception. The pace setters have thrown an interception. And just you saw in that extra point attempt, it hit the crossbar. So I guess one thing we could say right off the bat about OmniTurf is causing a bit of nervousness out there on the field so far today. <laughs> well, there's certainly been some unusual things happening, Frank. There's no question about that. Here we go now with first and... Uh, second rather and the ball goes over to Weisenberger and Weisenberger this time with the reception knocked down by Don Dignan Usually when uh, two clubs uh, go sparring head to head Bob and uh, not come away with a score and the old cliche of first blood settles matters down sometimes it does but uh, it doesn't do anything for the opposition So that second down coming up Weisenberg active both on the the kickoff as well as the reception. Here is Hill, a Finn rather, moving off the right side. And Finn, this time, appeared like there was a fumble in the ball, but I believe it was blown dead first. And there is a flag on the play. So let's see what the decision will be. The ball resting right now just across the 25-yard line. And then that illegal block uh, this time coming in low let's see how the decision will be made they've made the decision uh, the play has been called holding by the redmond 
And uh, you see the Redmen settling back down near the 10 yard line. And I would say that uh, the setter will probably take the, uh, take the play. This game right now has been dominated by St. John's defense and Pace on the offense. Pace leading by a six nothing score. They had two big opportunities and they finally cashed in on the second one. I wasn't There's the hold. I wasn't picking like Coach Mayer. I thought he would take the play, but uh, took the penalty here, pushing the uh, Redman just at the 19 yard line. Let's so, look at uh, the Redman's head coach, Bob Ricker. So that makes it a, a second and 12 to go. The ball's at the 13 yard line. Make that the, uh, the 18 yard line. Costa's pass. Oh, Reisenberger with a dive, just couldn't haul it in. Started by Morgan Stern. Beautifully thrown pass by Costa and a valley, a gallant attempt by Weisenberger to hold on to the football. Look at the little scuff on the right elbow. They're going to find out that uh, every time you play on this uh, army turf, you're going to have to have elbow pads on because that's going to be trouble. That's a good point. If you take a look at the replay, you can. That's, that's the friction burn, right, uh, Emerson? Indeed it is. Interline rolls over to his left, Acosta rather, excuse me, and uh, Weisenberger makes an outstanding attempt to get to the football. Had both hands on it, just couldn't hold it. So we're back now to the uh, line of scrimmage. Third and 13. And we have the flag that time, as you saw, is intended for Finn, and Brian Conboy was out there on the play, and number 28, you now can this, see the two bump together. This will be an interference call, but uh, I think it's in fairness to Conboy, it should not have been an interference call because Conboy recognized that the ball was being thrown in his area, turned to go to the football, the receiver ran into him in the attempt, but it looks as though uh, from the umpire, uh, the referee's point of view, it'll be called uh, interference or blocking. So St. John's, that's the first down as the result of that. They called it, of course, against uh, a pace, and Emerson explained the problem. Coster now has attempted to pass 13 times, completed five for 25 yards, is at one interception, and the Redmen now with a, a first down coming up. Balls at their own 24-yard line, and they trail by a score of six to nothing early in the second quarter here at Redmond Field at St. John's University. This time in the, the T formation, wide out on the right, Flanker on the left, Coster. Long pass deep downfield, too far for James Weisenberger. Weisenberger is a 6-3 tight end in Flushing, New York, a 235-pound senior who is closing in on the record to become the school's all-time leading receiver. Against Fordham, he set a league record last week. He had 10 passes caught for 156 yards and, and one touchdown. Well, he is a big target. 24-yard line, the ball, second and 10 to go for the Redmen. Here at St. John's University, 10.42 to go, second quarter. And Pace leads the Redmen by a score of six to nothing. The runner is Finn. And Finn picks up five yards off the right side, moving forward close to the 30-yard line. Now Manny Tosantis moves in the backfield, number 33 for the Redmen. Out of the ball game comes Emil Hill, number 26, as the Redmen. Now the third and four to go. Right now, the Redmen uh, looks to be uh, picking up a little momentum with their offense. They really have not gelled offensively all afternoon. Uh, I don't know why. It doesn't appear as though the setters are giving them much of a problem defense, but uh, then again, it could be. But it's a close one right now. And here are some beautiful uh, silhouette shots, as you can see, looking on the sideline as we now take a look at to see what this third down play will bring. Costa being rushed, spins, getting away, down he goes. Well, Costa kept looking downfield for Weisenberg at that time, but by the time he decided it was nigh time to let go of the ball, he was down himself. Number Coming in was Rich Middlebrook to pin him. Number 54, Middlebrook, one of those uh, academic uh, All-Americans, and uh, he is a pretty tough cookie there. And he leads the team in quarterback sacks. That was his sixth right that time, the 20-yard uh, line, and fourth down and 14 to go. Oh, the snap from center is high. The boot is a good one. 
goes across midfield. Good roll. Dealing watches it go out of bounds. So that gives Pace the ball once again. And here's a look at that, that sack that we spoke about. This is our first look at uh, the outstanding tackle for uh, the setters, number 54, Richie Middlebrook. As uh, Costa tries to scramble out of the pocket, Middlebrook finds him, and he's down. Just like little uh, Larian. That was the play, and as we saw on that play, there was very good defensive coverage. Uh, Ed Aline with his pass incomplete. Intended for Rich Johnson, close to the uh, midfield stripe. Ken Havriliak was over there to guard on the play. This past week in the Liberty Conference, the offensive player of the week was Paul Coster. And there is Paul right now. The little ice that he's putting on. He's a 6'4", 210-pounder from New Hyde Park, New York. In fact, that's the second time he's been the offensive player of the week. And the defensive player of the week was Neil Morgenstern, number 12 from Pace. Rookie of the week, Anthony Tricario, the kicker oh. from St. John's. Look at this. That was diagnosed very, very well by it? Mike Maddox. Maddox. Maddox, Maddox saw that play all the way, stepped underneath, and uh, was almost off to the races. Watch again here. You see Maddox, number 58, right in the center of your screen. He watches the quarterback in the line. In the line, delivers. Maddox works him, himself into the flight of the ball. Looks to be uh, trying to go to Rich Johnson and uh, picked it off. Uh, uh, Augie Marchetti makes the tackle. So Mike Maddox coming up with that ball that time. A big play for Maddox, the 205-pounder from Bayside, New York. That time, Chris Fenn, the ball carrier, was batting around like a ping pong ball across the, across the army turf. Morgan Stern and Frank both in that time. Finn was in there at the 30-yard line with second and nine to go. So the Redmen now have an opportunity on that uh, Maddich interception. <laughs> as Mike Maddich from the secondary position is once again given the Redmen an opportunity right now deep in pace territory. It's second and nine to go. Ball just resting on the 30-yard line. Toward the sideline to Sass. Sass has the ball. Knocked out of bounds on the play by Brian Conboy. I was wondering how long it was going to take Costa to figure out that He's got to now get away from Doug Bieling and try, try Conboy on the other side. I thought he would do it when it was backed up inside the two or one yard line. Now watch it again here. It's no secret right away. Number 15, Costa, is looking for 31, 81, rather, uh, Tony Sass. And that's Conboy in the trail position. Outstanding throw, good catch, fine reception. So it's a first down to go and goal to go and the ball resting on that eight yard line. First and goal to go at the eight-yard line for the St. John's Redmen. In motion is Weisenberger. Coster, thrown for a loss on the play. A great defensive effort by Neil Morgenstern, number 12, who came bursting in to get the St. John's quarterback. That time, I, I'm sure Coster thought he could uh, beat the blitz. He sees the blitz coming right in, but Morgenstern gets right inside, gets a hand on Coster, and that was no letting go. That was a big 22-yard pass play that put St. John's in scoring position. They're at the 12-yard line right now, where it's second and goal to go from the 12. With that loss on the play. That was a big safety blitz with Marvin Stern setting inside. Again, the rush is on. And there's a ball toward the end zone, which is Beeling covering on the play. Andy O'Connell, the intended receiver, and the pass incomplete. Again, they don't really realize how tough this little guy Beeling is, uh, but they yet they keep trying it. I said little guy, Beeling is not really that little. He's 5'9", 175 pounds. Shows that he can play the game. He's tough. Uh, anybody will get beat occasionally, but the, he's, one of, he's one of the finer defensive players in the secondary. There's a look at the mascot. I don't think that's Carl Rohn in that bar, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. 
Aha, uh -huh, might be bladders in there. Third and goal to go. Ball at the 12 yard line. Costa being rushed. And the ball is fumbled, and I believe it was fumbled out of bounds without possession. It is incomplete. The pass intended for Christopher Finn. So that means it's a fourth down coming up. As we take a look at the replay right now, the fourth and goal to go from the 12. As you see, Costa looked off to his right, looked downfield, then come back at the last minute. That was his outlet pass, his safety valve, coming over to number 22, Chris Finn. And Chris just couldn't hold on to the football. Fourth and 12 to go, and Anthony Precario is the booting specialist, but the timeout is called by the St. John's Redmen. With the timeout, by the way, Pace goes over to the huddle, as you can see, with their coach along the sideline to make sure they go over their defensive employment and strategy at this point. St. John's on the field. That shows you've got to be in shape to play this game. Uh, I think if I were a defensive player, I really wouldn't want to run over to the sidelines <laughs> and confer with my coach. We'll be back for this big play in a moment. First, let us tell you you're watching Liberty Conference football on cable vision. I like to treat my women right. So when in Queens, we dine at the Sly Fox Inn. It's casual, so I can relax and elegant so I can impress her. The food is superb with a wide selection of American dishes to satisfy even the most hard to please lady. So come to the Sly Fox Inn and bring someone special. The Sly Fox Inn is open seven days a week for lunch and dinner. Jerry's second season of Liberty Conference football underway and Apple Bank Pack is a sponsor. I know you've got some exciting news ahead. Harry, we're delighted to be back and we do have exciting news. At Apple Bank, we're introducing the Apple Bank Family Program, which provides low-cost loans, free checking, and great credit card rates. And you'll be hearing and reading a lot about this in weeks to come. Apple Bank for Savings, with five convenient locations on Long Island. Well, a big play coming up now, Emerson. St. John's with a fourth down. The ball is at the 12 of Pace University, St. John's, Trails by a score of six to nothing in the ball game. With over six minutes to go. And in the ball game now is Anthony Tricario. On the sidelines here, we have the, the sideline player that you just saw. That's uh, Casenza, Anthony. Anthony Casenza, his Tricario's boot. It is, I believe, wide to the left. It was wide to the left. It was a low line drive. Steve Hankey came in uh, very quickly that time along with dealing on defense to hinder that effort but the boot was wide so that gives Pace University the ball well that's one of the few times now that Tricario has been just uh, extra special this year in the the kicking department uh, finally didn't cash in in fact uh, he's gone five for five in field goals, 11 for 11 in extra points till he missed at that opportunity. So Pace University takes over at the 20. And the quick moment he play moves the ball out of the 24 as Augie Marchetti is the ball carrier. That was a quick hitter and a good looking opening for Augie. And I'm sure Augie was somewhat uh, surprised. Uh, but Augie has that quickness that he uh, needs to get into the, into the line as quickly as he did that last play. It's second down coming up. Ball at the 24, second and six to go. A 29-yard field goal attempt missed by Marchetti. He pace with the ball. And away is the ball ripped out of his hands. Who's going to pick it up? Looks like St. John's. Let's see. We're waiting. This is a big call. Who got the ball? I think the oh, Red pace. missed it again. <laughs> they, they appear to have had it at one point. It looks as though uh, Interline got back to recover his own fumble. Well, that was a close one. That ball was just taken away, knocked down, and the dive of the ball, Pace was able to recover. The ball is at the 11-yard line, where it's now third and 19. So a big play for Pace, holding onto that ball, which could have been real danger for them, under five minutes to go in the second quarter. Out of the ball game goes Marchetti for the Pace setters. 
Wide now to the left, we have Johnson, Rich Johnson, number one. Baron back is spread on the right side. And the give is right down the middle as Bill Caput finds opening. Look at him go! Oh, what a thrust by Phil Capra. <laughs> All the way out to the 41-yard line. How did he get that for you, Emerson? That was uh, a counter draw type play as he watched again. Watch the two linemen, 55. Uh, him come over counter trap. As you see, uh, Capra slides right behind number, number 55, Lefer, uh, Lefer, uh, for Lefer, oh, Lefer, I can't get the word out there. The last name, the guard on the block. Okay, Lafrolita, you were you were right on target there, Emerson. Here we go now as Adeline looks deep, throws to Johnson, and yeah. Johnson takes it out of bounds. Rich Johnson. That 30-yard run by Phil Capra, longest run of the afternoon, and this pass to Johnson has now moved the ball into St. John's territory. As we take a look at the replay, the ball will be at the St. John's 47-yard line. Roll the left to end line. He'll have uh, number one, Rich Johnson, turning out deep out downfield. There he is in the view of your screen. Nice catch, good reception. It's first and 10 at the 47-yard line of the Redmen. Rush on Edeline down the middle, and it is intercepted. <laughs> Ball is down Mike Marchetti there. finally hauled it in for the Redmen. There's and a flag on the play. And the penalty as it goes down. Nobody really wanted the ball at that time. Fernback uh, or uh, Rich Johnson. They both had, Rich Johnson had it. Fernback had a shot at it. But uh, Orchetti, or Jenny rather, made sure he had it. So Mike Argenti was the man on the spot when that ball went popping around. We also have a flag on the play. And let's take a look at the replay on that. There's a clip, I believe. Look at it again here as Enderline rolls to his right. Now works backside. He finds number one, Rich Johnson, coming in a crossing pattern. Ball hits him into his chest. Passed by the hands of Fernback and into the hands of number 52, Mike Argenti. And the, uh, the penalty against the Redmen on the clip moves the ball all the way back right now to the 14-yard line. So there's the penalty as we see some of the, the young, uh, younger fans looking on with the, the older cheerleaders. All right. <laughs> Incoming freshmen, no doubt, right, Emerson? Yeah, these are the setters. Uh, I guess they're taking them off the young up yeah. there. <laughs> It's that Westchester County air, I guess. Here we go, 14-yard line. It's first and 10 to go for St. John's. Oh, a beautiful tackle that time. Christopher Finn running, and John Dignan came slicing in. Got him just over the ankles, number 56. Beautiful tackle. Number 56, John Dignan, the soft from Brewster, New York. Take another look at it. See how he came in that time. Emerson. Again, you'll see Dignan off to the left of your screen here as uh, Finn uh, receives the football. Dignan slides off the uh, corner, gets to the ankles of 22, Chris Finn. That makes it a second and 12 to go. The Redmen having a difficult job generating the offense that we've seen them come up with in recent weeks. Now Coster keeping and goes out of bounds. He had gone past or close to the line of scrimmage that time. There wasn't much opportunity to do much except move the ball across the sidelines. In the, in the early goings, I thought that the, uh, the defense of the setters was not giving uh, uh, Costa any problems, but uh, here late in the, in the second quarter, uh, it has to be the defensive scheme and alignment of the setters that has caused a little bit of confusion for, uh, for Costa. Well, they keep uh, changing their defenses continually, which uh, certainly is wrecking havoc with the Costa offensive plan. The ball to 16, it's third and eight. And offensively, uh, they're going to multiple offenses as well. And still, the opportunity to get that ball out of deep of their own territory is not there as Coster. They'll try to find maneuvering room, a stop by Matt Riker, to early come up with a couple of uh, big plays. So that makes it fourth down coming up for the Redmen as Mark Kowal will be going back into punt formation. Doug Beeling is now deep. He's standing just beyond the midfield stripe. As you can see, Kowal standing right there on his goal line. This is a fourth and 10 to go. 
There's a good kick that's going across midfield. It's taken on the 42-yard line. This is Beeling. And Beeling thrown out of bounds just there he crosses midfield. So Pace takes over with the time showing. Two minutes and 20 seconds to go in the second quarter. Again, the setters have the football in uh, excellent field position. The second quarter has been basically uh, this way for the setters, and uh, they've just got to do more with it. Last week, Pace defeated CW Post 31 to 6. St. John's beat Fordham 38 to 7. So both these teams scored a lot of points last week, but today we expected a scoring duel with these two great passes. But it's six nothing right now. Pace leads. 2.20 to go in this second quarter. Antoline looking to Johnson, throws to Johnson, and it is yes. caught by Johnson, but he was out of bounds. Now that was just super concentration, an excellent throw by Antoline, and good defensive coverage by uh, Aureliak, but uh, unfortunately the ball was uh, out of bounds. It's a second and 10 to go. The time, 2.13. Ball for 47. Again, we have the receiver spread wide on the left. That's Johnson. This time, the give down the middle. Little yardage this play as Phil Capra can't find openings on the right side that he did earlier. Friends, if you're looking to lease an automobile, Allstate Vehicle Leasing is the name to remember. Allstate Vehicle has the best service and the most competitive rates in the area. So if you're interested in leasing an automobile in the near future, Allstate Vehicle Leasing is the place to go. Allstate Vehicle Leasing, located on 4201 Northern Boulevard in Long Island City. Or call 718-937-7500. It's third and ten. The ball, the Redmen, 47. In the shotgun. That's taken care of very quickly by number 73, Patrick Dunnigan, who has really played an outstanding game. A sophomore, 5'11", 225-pounder from St. James, New York. And he came bustling in that time. And that will bring Dan Issa in the ball game to do the booting for Pace University. Ball right now is resting on the 43-yard line of Pace. 43, it's a fourth and 20 at this point. Issa getting set to boot. Tony Sass is the safety. And here's the boot. This one is a wobbly kick getting toward the sidelines. A short kick, and it goes out of bounds at the 37. 51 seconds left to go in this half. Here's Frank Catali with a comment. Frank. Yeah, Bob, I, I'm working on a theory down here. Let's go back three weeks. Three weeks ago, uh, Kings Point defeated Post in a big game by a point, 21-20. Oh, Next up. week, Kings Point loses to Fordham by a point, and then Fordham has a big game next week, and they lose to St. John's. They get blown away 38-7. Now, this week, we have a big game for St. John's, and at the moment, they're losing 6-0. So maybe it's about getting the teams letting down a little bit. There's a trend that's been going on in the Liberty Conference the past three weeks, something like that. Emerson, is there anything maybe uh, the, the player have to take it upon himself after a big win that they have to keep themselves up and go out and give it 100 and 150 percent the following week so they don't don't let up? Uh, indeed, they do. Not solely upon themselves, but certainly they must uh, realize the fact that the, once you play a big ball game and you come out victoriously, you've got to keep that kind of mental toughness, mental highness to come back uh, next week because the guys are not going to lay down for you. You've got to earn it. And we just saw that pass over to Tony Sass with time running out there. 47 seconds to go. The ball is resting in the 44. We're at second and three to go for St. John's. 47 seconds to go in this first half of play. Again, Costa to the airwaves. This one down the middle. It was short. Tended for O'Connell. Again, his receiver slipped down coming out of the backfield. In the last uh, few minutes, looking for O'Connell, he came back off. Saw the pin had fallen down until he just released the football. That makes it a third down play, three to go. Ball at the 44. Score once again, pace six, and St. John's nothing. We're deep in the second quarter, which less than a minute to play. As St. John's comes out of the huddle, and the two setbacks behind Coster. Wide right, wide left.
Oh, it is intercepted by Don Siegman. What a game he has played. So Don Dignan on that interception, that stops the clock now with 33 seconds to go. That gives Pace the opportunity. The ball is now at the 42-yard line. And Pace is an opportunity now with first and 10 at the Redmen, 42. That was a big play there, Bob. We just can't uh, say enough about it, but we'll see how big it was for the center offense because they've got to realize that this is a tremendous turnover and capitalize on it. In a shotgun formation, everybody is spread wide. A long pass down the middle. It is complete. What a beautiful catch by Dan Rena. And the clock now with 26 seconds to go as Rena jumped up for that beautiful pass. The ball is at the 14-yard uh, line where it's first and 10 to go for the pace setters. Stopped by Norton. Give uh, Coach uh, Mayer credit here. What he did here, he caught uh, both these safeties in what we call a doubling position uh, on both sides. He got his uh, big tight end down the middle of those two guys. Excellent completion. Good call, a good completion. A 28-yard pass play. It's first and 10 to go for pace. 26 seconds to go. And the Setters lead the Redmen by a score of 6 to nothing in this Liberty Conference football game this afternoon. Skies are bright now. The sun has come out. The day has gotten warmer as we go along. Now back in the, uh, the lineup for the Redmen goes Brian Collins, number 75, and Pace holding around their, their quarterback, Kevin Enterlein. He's a senior, by the way, but has one more year of eligibility. He's a transfer from Central Connecticut. First and 10 at the 14. And once again, staying in the shotgun with wide outs on both sides and turned back as a slot back right. Interline moves that ball to about the 12 or the 11 yard line before Dunnigan brings him down. And the time shows 16 seconds on the clock. Timeout is called by Pace University, stopping the clock with 16 seconds to go in this first half of play. And Pace moving that ball ever closer. The ball right now placed at the 12-yard uh, line. So that's what's happening right now. As we move down, and Enterline goes over to the sidelines to speak to his coach, George Mayer. Here's Emerson. Here, yeah, the brain trust uh, gets uh, the word to Enterline and uh, see what uh, exactly. Let's take a look at that last play. Uh, as you see, it looks as though Dunnigan on the trail end here gets a little finger, or somebody gets the get the hand business down near the end. We really can't see it totally. There it is in the the right hand in the face mask. I can't see who it really is. Looks to be number 19. You know who that is, Bob. Number 19, the speaking of right now, is Brian Norton. Yeah, it looked to be Norton coming up with a hand in the face mask. Uh, just shades of last week, Marty Lyon getting off of a quarterback that way. Here we go now. Second. Down coming up. There's a long pass in the end zone. It is a touchdown. Johnson scores. Rich Johnson. Kenneth Riliak was back to guard, and the pass went soaring over him as Rich Johnson pulls it in with 11 seconds to go in this first half. Now, that was a big play, key touchdown. It looks as though for a moment there, Rich Johnson had pushed off on number 27, Ken Riliak, but the call was not made, nor, would it, nor was he pushed. He just slipped going down to the turf. And uh, Anderline's ninth touchdown pass breaks Doug Woodward's old record of pace for much TD most TD passes in a season. As we get set now for the extra point by, well, they're going to run for this one or pass. And it is incomplete. So they went for the two pointer. Tended for Rich Johnson. But the six points make it a 12 nothing game with 11 seconds to go in this first half of play. It looks as though the Redmen really don't want it as badly as the Pacers do. We're going back into a replay. Look at it again here. This is for the touchdown. Number one off to the left of your screen, Rich Johnson, and really are covering. 
as they both leaped for the football. I thought at one moment that uh, Rilak had been pushed, but he leaped, lost his balance, and uh, Johnson comes down for the TD. Pace with a 12 to nothing lead and 11 seconds to go. Finn is the uh, deep man now for St. John's as Pace's Issa gets set to, to kick off. So Kevin Enterline, who started out the game needing 208 yards passing for a single season record, is mounting the yardage with his passes now. And here's the boot. Rowan skittering along the field, and it is touched and down right there. And that was a smart thing to do as the uh, ball carrier looks to be Emil, goes over, slips down, and uh, just holds on to the football. Number 26, Emil Hill. He just went down, no sense taking a chance in a long run back with a high one, so they just sent it along the ground. Pace leading by a score of 12 to nothing. Johnson on a 12-yard pass from Enterline. Pass failed for the two-point conversion. Three plays, 42 yards, a time of 22 seconds. And here we go now with just seconds left to go in this half. St. John's with the ball. And they're just going to run out the clock right now as the seconds are now ticking away. Five to go, and that's the last play of the, the first half as Pace will take a 12-point lead into the locker room, which is surprising. They thought it would be an even game. If anything, St. John's perhaps a slight favorite because they are undefeated in the Liberty Conference. Last year is a 15-14 game. St. John's one by one. And Pace determined to come out here and avenge the homecoming loss they suffered at home last year. And we have more coming up, so stay right with us. You're watching Liberty Conference Football on Cablevision. How expensive is your free checking? You're looking at checking that's really free. That's right. Here at Apple Bank, there are no check charges and no monthly fees, nothing. Plus, you get five and a quarter percent interest on any balance over $700. So come in and get the free checking that you and your money deserve. Apple Bank for savings. We're good for you. Five million square feet of office and industrial space is being built on Long Island. For Long Island's energy company, that translates into increased demand for efficient, reliable service. Lilco is responding by beefing up a service force. Already 100 apprentice line workers are starting the rigorous training. It's a tough program, but to serve Long Island better, that's what's needed. Lilco, working harder than ever to provide energy for a growing Long Island. It's halftime here at St. John's, and Pace Setters lead the Redmond by a score of 12 to nothing. Halftime means one thing. It's time for the Liberty Conference Report. And taking a look at the standings in the Liberty Conference, St. John's has that 2-0 record, Kings Point 2-1, Pace 1-1, Fordham 1-1, Iona 0-1, Post 0-2. If Pace can win this game today, they'll create a big log jam there. There will be a three-way tie for first place in the conference. Uh, uh, the games today, Post is playing Montclair State, number, number two ranked Montclair State. Kings Point is back in action at number three Gettysburg. So tough, tough, tough non-conference games for those top two teams. Fordham versus Villanova, Iana against Maris. Hofstra's playing Wagner today. So today is really, this game right here we're doing today is the only conference game of the day. Coming up, games on Cablevision, Kings Point, St. John's looks like could be another first place battle next week on Cablevision. And the following week after that, St. John's takes on CW Post. Okay, my first halftime guest is uh, Jack Kaiser, the athletic director at St. John's. Big day. Good, Jack. Good, big day for St. John's, all their people here, the family. Opening day, OmniTurf, the new artificial surface. Uh, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about how OmniTurf came to St. John's. Yes, well, we were discussing uh, this type of surface for several years, and uh, because of the uh, amount of usage that our field gets, it's very difficult to maintain it when it's a grass surface. Uh, also, uh, something that came into play, you know we're a commuter school and we need plenty of parking. Yeah. So uh, last spring, they decided to take half of our practice field away, which is right adjacent to the stadium here, uh, for additional parking for our commuter students. 
uh, with that in mind, I went to the administration and told them that we were in bad shape as far as our playing facility here in the stadium, and they agreed to uh, uh, bring this great new surface here for our, our teams. Beside football, which is playing on it right now in the fall, uh, soccer will also be using it. They started practice this, practice this week, and in the spring, the lacrosse team will also use it. In addition, as you know, the track is still around the outside, so uh, the track team will be in here plenty. Uh, in addition, uh, we will have some intramural activities, and uh, for example, uh, we host uh, high school events. St. Francis Prep uses this as their home field, and they'll be playing their first game here tomorrow. And is it true that Bob Bricka, the head coach of the football team, had a lot to do with bringing the, the field here? The he, certain, he certainly did. He, uh, he knew the uh, difficult situation we had maintaining the grass surface, and he and I have had discussions for quite a few years now. Uh, Bob was one of the ones, along with our training staff, who did the research on the different types of surface. Uh, we found that the people who had this already installed were very happy with it, the OmniTurf, that is. It's uh, a lot softer than a lot of the other uh, that are on the market, and uh, right now we're very happy with it, not with the game, with the surface, <laughs> and uh, hopefully the second half will show us a lot better. Uh, getting away from the OmniTurf for a second, the basketball team is about to open up its season. That's just around the corner. Yes, October 15th is the first day that they're allowed to practice. And obviously, we hope for another fine season. We hope the fans will be with us. Uh, coach Conaseca, his assistant coaches, and the team will be looking for their support. Okay, uh, but be, uh, before I get going here with uh, Todd Jamison, just like to say, you're not going to put OmniTurf in uh, Alumni Hall, are you? No, we're definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, thanks for coming by, and you'll receive a gift certificate from Royale Sporting Goods. Jack Kaiser has been my first guest at halftime. We'll be back with ex St. John's quarterback Todd Jamison. You're watching Liberty Conference Football on Cablevision. Sullivan County Community College, a great start that never ends. A two-year SUNY with day and night classes, great career choices while you're making new friends. Communications, photography, a restaurant management and media arts, undeclared major, computer science, food service management, commercial art, sports, movies, concert and dance, or great social life and maybe romance. Sullivan County Community College, a place for fun, a place for knowledge. Sullivan County Community College, a place for fun, a place for knowledge. I raised my SAT score 240 points. Because I have an individualized computer program, I can come in and learn at any time. I really got the help I needed to fill out all the financial aid forms for college. We offer academic and financial support services to high school students who are looking forward to college. So call us at the Student Aid Center, 516-271-AIDE. One pint of blood helps five people fight disease and receive life-saving medical care, whether it be a newborn receiving a transfusion, a patient struggling against cancer, or someone undergoing heart surgery. Your gift of blood helps your friends and neighbors fight for their lives and win. This is Celeste Holm, asking you to think about how important your gift of blood will be. Life is worth fighting for. Please give blood. Back here at halftime, St. John's trailing pace by score of 12 to nothing. Todd Jameson, Redmond quarterback between the years 1981 and 1983. Uh, team's having a bit of a rough go out today with pace. Yeah, I think they're having a, especially the offense, I think they're having a hard time getting on track. You know, I, you know, I feel, especially as a quarterback, you got to get a certain feel for the game and a, a certain rhythm. I don't think they're, uh, they've got that yet. And hopefully they get getting the second half. Paul Coster, as you know, last week had a big, big uh, game, throw over, over 400 yards. Uh, yourself, you've thrown, you lead uh, St. John's with career touchdown passes, 43. This man shooting at your record now, huh? Yeah, he's right on my tail. I was, I was reading the paper last week, and I, this is the first game I really got to. And I said, my goodness, this guy, he's on fire. He's all over me. I mean, I had to come check him out. <laughs> uh, how about your days when you were playing with St. John's? Uh, must be a lot of fun, memories, some great games, a rivalry with Hofstra, of course. They're playing Wagner today. Well, like you said, it was a lot of fun, you know, and to me that meant a lot to have a lot of fun. And it made it easier to play. You know, our guys, we were, we were somewhat together, you know, and we gelled well as a team. We had a lot of fun, so that made it a lot easier. You also uh, have the record for most touchdown passes in the game, five. Who did that come against? Hofstra. <laughs> 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 Who else better to get against? <laughs> uh, how about in the games against Pace, Getting, playing Pace today, opening day on the Omniturf field? How about, how about your days against Pace? Well, you know, 
as an emphasize right now, pace is always tough against St. John's. I don't know what it is, man. They have a good game plan against us, or whatever it may be. They're, always, they're a bunch of tough guys, and we always play them tough. They, you know, they played us tough, but we also played them tough. But we just we managed to, to outdo them, so to say. What's your feeling on the uh, artificial surface? This new surface, OmniTurf, is supposed to cut down injuries, uh, better than the artificial turf, similar to grass. What, what are your feelings? Did you like playing on the artificial surfaces as opposed to grass? Well, for my style of game, the artificial surface was to my advantage, I'd say. Overall, for, I'd say, for uh, the whole game, I, I wouldn't really, uh, you know, advise it. it. It really adds up on the injuries. Guys get hurt, and a lot of ligaments and tendons and pull a lot of knee problems. But the Omni turf, the way they've done it, it seems to be uh, effective so far. Yeah. Okay, uh, one, mo one more question, Todd, before we let you go. Game at Hofstra, 49-46 victory uh, against the Dutchman. Is that the highlight of your career? Yes, I have to say that was the best game I've ever, not only played, I've ever, I've ever been in. Most exciting. And uh, I'll always remember that. Great, Todd. Uh, thanks for stopping by. You'll also receive a gift certificate from Royale Sporting Goods. Enjoy the second half. Maybe the Redmen can pull something off. If not, there's plenty of games ahead, right? This is true. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Todd Jameson has been my halftime guest. Bob Wolf and Emerson Boozer will be back with the opening kickoff in quarter number three. You're watching Liberty Conference football right here on Cablevision. We may say we're English leather or we're nothing at all. But there's no law that says you can't do both. Genevieve's Drugs has rousing savings on great gift ideas for that cheerleader in your life. 1.5 ounce heaven sent spray cologne on sale for just $5.99. One ounce loves baby soft spray cologne only $6.19. And 1.5 ounce loves body mist for just $5.69. Great savings at Genevieve's Drugs. America, we now have a new national treasure, one that symbolizes our people and our achievements. The intrepid Sea Air Space Museum. She's the other lady in the harbor who opened her decks to all our boys in the Pacific and the Atlantic. She was the mighty floating part of America that welcomed her Mercury and Gemini astronauts home. So come to Manhattan and West 46th Street and the Hudson River. Step back in history and leap forward into the future. Here are the halftime stats. Getting set now for the second half to get in the way. Pace leads St. John's 12 nothing. Bob Wolf here with Emerson Boozer, Frank Vitale. And Emerson, what do your cleaned eyes see as you look at the halftime stats? It shows right away in first downs that uh, Pace has had the greater opportunities uh, with the football. Rushing, uh, no real big difference there. The key here is in passing. 58 yards for uh, the Redmen and 63 for the setters. Now, that's only about a five-yard difference in there. But the key being, uh, some of those five-yard passes have been for a six-pointer. Mm-hmm. And so far in the uh, passing attack, seven for 19 for St. John, seven for 19 for Pace University. So both quarterbacks have been off the mark, certainly compared to their previous outings this season. The score, 12-0. And to repeat the scoring, Theron back on a six-yard pass from Edeline. The kick failed. That made it Pace six, St. John's nothing. And then Johnson on a 12-yard pass from Edeline, who, by the way, set a new uh, school record, a number of passes with that one. That pass also failed for the two-point. Nine touchdown passes for Edeline for the pace record. And tells Pace leaves by a score of 12-0 as we get set to go here in this second half of play. For St. John's, this has been quite a letdown from the uh, onslaught they had last week against Fordham. And let's see whether or not they've been able to regroup as we get set for the second half. The boot. And it's taken by Johnson. And Johnson is filled quickly. Returning that boot by Precario. And here's Frank. Okay, Bob, thanks. Uh, I'm down here with the, cer the certain kinds of footwear that are being worn on the Omni Turf. Jack Phelan, the equipment manager here at St. John's for the football team, told me that the players are going to be experimenting today because they're not quite sure of the Omniturf under game situations. They will not be wearing these type of shoes. These are spikes used for regular grass, so uh, they won't be wearing these. Okay, Frank will return. It's an interesting dissertation in just a moment. And Farrenbach was the intended receiver, and I guess uh, 
We'll go back to those shoes once again, Frank. The spikes, you won't see these today. These are called field generals. You'll see the little pimples on the bottom of them. These are also being worn today. Also, these are the Nike Sharks, called Sharks because of the little pointy teeth on the bottom of these shoes. Um, Tony Sass is wearing shoes similar to these, with little cleats sticking out of the sides, out of the front. And these are called the Nike Air. Paul Costa, quarterback of St. John's, is wearing these shoes. And uh, these are also being worn by the running backs and the defensive backs. Costa, if he didn't like these, he was going to go to plain old, everyday, run-of-the-mill basketball sneakers. That's about it. <laughs> Would you believe it that many years ago, a person had like one pair of shoes or sneakers, I don't care what it was. Of course now, not only do they have shoes for running, for tennis, for bowling, for jogging, anything you want, but when it comes to football shoes, you can see Frank said the same selection, depending on the field, the surroundings, the weather, everything else. But right now, the problem now is footing and it's getting some offense started for pace at a line with the ball. There's a third down play. And the pass is batted up in the air. It is intercepted. Ryan Collins, number 75, dove in as that ball was coming out and intercepted the ball for the Redmen intended for Johnson. So Collins, number 75, was there to gather it in. And the Redmen take over now in pace territory at the pace 32. We look at it again here as Interline rolls out to his right. The pocket starts to get a little bit crowded, so he steps back up into an opening. Watch number 17, Bob uh, Nyland, Nyland rather, goes over, uh, takes a pop at it. Not really Nyland, I think it might have been Murtha. It really gave it a jolt, and uh, the ball was free for anybody's grab. So Collins with a big interception as that ball was battered around, much like a volleyball game. And here the Redmen with Costa rolling out, and still looking, still looking, and now... Still looking, throws, and complete. Emil Hill. And that took a lot of doing before, before Hill was finally sighted by Coster as he moves that ball inside the 10-yard line where he'll be first and goal to go. Take another look here as Coster goes out to his uh, right. Now he gets pressure, even though uh, you don't see it in your screen here. He sees the opposition coming up. That's McKenna coming up. Gives him pressure. Looks as though he's tackled. Now, credit Hill for uh, working himself free and getting into the vision of Costa for the completion. 29-yard pass play to Santos. And DeSantis is thrown for a loss. Beautiful tackle lot time as the left side came in and diagnosed it. Leading the charge was Peter Frank, number 34, who has made some opportune tackles for the uh, pace setters. So that was a big loss on the play, and it's now at the 16-yard line where it's second and goal to go. And I think that that, that moment, number 33, Manny DeSantis, uh, really showed his inexperience in the backfield. Uh, you, when you're in trouble, you never try to lose more yards, and that time by bending back, he lost about 10 yards. He did that. Now out of the eye, Costa looks. Now he's being pursued, gets free, stumbles, and goes down. Once again... Tony Lucci was in there very quickly, number 50, and coming in to help out on the play was Neil Morgenstern, number 12, and we've seen two outstanding defensive plays now by Pace, and all of a sudden, it's at the 26th with third and goal to go for the Redmen. Again, Costa's come back basically with the same kind of play as you see him work, but number 50, the outside linebacker on that side, Tony Lucci comes in, and Lucy's not that big, 5'8", 185 pounds, as opposed to Costa being 6'3", 220. It looks as though he'd pull away free, but uh, Lucy held on and to get the tackle. So that falls to the 26, where it's now third and goal at the 26-yard line. With the slot back on the right this time. In motion, Weisenberger. Pitch over the middle, batted up in the air, intercepted! Look at that play as the Pace University Setters have Doug Feeling with the interception. He's the fellow who's been so outstanding at interceptions for them. And that ball batted up in the air. We've seen a lot of that. Great block by Don Dignan to help set him up. And Feeling just being swarmed by his teammates for the interception. Well, look Pace at it. is really on the ball tonight. Look at it again here as uh, Costa goes off to the uh, right side. The ball is tipped twice out of the hands, finally out of the hands of Tony Sass. And who is waiting in the wings, number four, the ever-battling Doug Beely. The 33-yard interception return, and now the ball is in Redmen territory at the 49-yard line. 
So pace with the ball. Antoline looks for Johnson, throws short, however, and it was intended for Marchetti, number 20, who was hit by Brian Norton going across the line. We've seen a lot of balls batted up in the air today, uh, Emerson, haven't we? Yes, we have, and that has nothing to do with the turf. Uh, that's a matter of not poor concentration on the football, and sometimes it's thrown a little bit too high where it tips off the fingertips, but that last one was just uh, hit in the hands, bounced out of one intended receiver into the other, and out of that one, into the hands of number four, Doug Beeling. At the 48 of 48 and a half, at second and 10 to go. Wide outs on either side and a slot back on the right. That's fair and back. Now the question is, was he inbounds? Yes, he was when he caught it. So Rob Fehrenbach, who caught eight passes last week against CW Post, including a touchdown. Let's take a look at the replay and watch the Fehrenbach roof right now, now number this seven. Is, this is truly a mismatch. Number seven, Fehrenbach, a, 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 a wide receiver or a wing back. He's being covered by number 75, Brian Collins. And Collins is 6'3", 245, a total mismatch of speed, full of speed. Here at the 38-yard line where it's first and 10 to go. And this opened it to Marchetti on the left side, picks up very short yardage. It'll be second. About nine, eight and a half to go, as the ball right now is resting at the 37-yard line in Redman territory. Mike Maddich was in on the stop there, and the score remains 12-0 as the pace setters lead the St. John's Redmen. 37 and second and nine. The Redmen will have to skip in here defensively. They cannot afford to allow the setters to go up 18 points on them here in the third quarter. And a line to Ferenbach. Ferenbach leaps. Who's going to get it? It's knocked down. A good defensive play. The Redmen breaking it up as Ken Hubiliak, number 27, was there to break it up. The sophomore who played at St. Francis Prep before coming on to the Redmen. Well covered by Hubiliak. Uh, he got burned uh, just before the half on the right side. We'll watch it again here uh, as Interline throws. He throws it inside. Had he thrown it on the outside, uh, would have given his receiver, Ferenbach, a better shot at getting to the football. But uh, give credit to have really act for having that excellent position. And as he came down, he almost was able to hold on to the ball himself. We're in a third down situation. The ball remains at the 37 on the shotgun snap. And this one is overthrown. Actually, there was no uh, receiver near there. Johnson, I guess, was the closest number one. Brian Collins was back defending. And George Mayer starts the sidelines as he saw that his passes didn't go where he wanted them to go on that particular play. So it's 37-yard line, fourth down, nine yards to go. And Dan Issa is back in the lineup to do the punting as Tony Sass is waiting about 15 yards from his end zone. He'll be kicking from just across midfield. And here's the kick. He angles it toward the sidelines, but it's a relatively short kick going outside, inside the 20. So that's where the Redmen will take over right now with first and 10 to go. We're in the third quarter with 10.48 to go as Bob Rickon is wondering why the Redmen can't generate some offense. Of course, they, they do have some injuries. First and 10 at the 19. John Casenza, who was very much at evidence last week, is out. Brian Williams, who is the workhorse, is out of the lineup. In fact, he's second in rushing for St. John's, only to Dennis Blygen, now at the New York Jets. So the Redmen take over in their own 19. Beautiful thrust through the middle. Christopher Finn finding running room off the right guard spot. Finally stopped by Don Dignan. So Dignan with the stop. And that ball rushed forward for a first down. Moves the ball just close to the 30-yard line. Excellent play calling that time by Paul, I mean by Costa, Paul Costa. He caught the pace setters in a five-man line. And usually, by rule of thumb, you come back to what we call the bubble side or the uh, open side uh, for the extra yardage. First and 10 to go. Another handoff, this time to Santis, 
Can't find running room off the left side. He's met by Middlebrook. Lucci is also in on the stop. Tony Lucci, number 50. That ball will be placed just across the 30 at the 31, where it'll be second and nine to go. Again, now, the setters went into a five-man line, but they shifted it over to their left, St. John's right, and uh, it appears as though Costa uh, went to a checkoff, came back with the same running play that uh, Finn gained that yard at the 10 yards on before, but this time the setters shut it down. Emil Hill takes DeSantis' place from the lineup. Second and nine to go at the 31-yard line. The Redmond trailing by a score of 12-0 early in the third quarter. Costa looks, and this one batted up in the air and again intercepted, this time by McKenna. And McKenna knocked out of bounds. Can you imagine? This is almost like a, like a set play. You throw it, we'll bat it up, and we got a teammate to recover. Give credit to number four, Doug Beeling. Beeling came in to bat the ball up in the air, watch again here in the five-man line as uh, Costa rolls off to his right slightly. Now watch here, number four, Beeling goes up. Bingo with O'Connell, jarring the ball loose, and number 44, McKenna picks it up for the interception. Just amazing. It's very difficult to tell. That's the fourth interception, by the way, and there's McKenna over there. The fourth interception. Marchetti with the thrust off the right side. It's difficult to tell in any game whether it's a question of St. John's being that flat or pace so up, but there's no question that when it comes to the opportunists that the setters are doing the job, aren't they? Again, they are, I, I mentioned in the first half of our telecast that it appears as though the setters wanted the football game a little bit more seemingly than the Redmen. It's second, five to go, the ball at the 21-yard line for pace. This time, in the eye, and up give to Marchetti. And Marchetti finds a little room off that left side, moving forward to the 16-yard line before he is filled on the play by Brian Collins. Augie Marchetti, a 5'7 junior from Brooklyn. Right now, the officials are gonna come out and measure. And you can take a look right now. Oh, it's He's going inches to be short. short. Looks to be a good six, seven inches. So it's a third down play coming up. Now back in the lineup for the uh, St. John's Redmond goes John Krieg. Let's guess along Michael with... Michael Potestas the, comes out. With interline here, Bob. Uh, you think he'll go and get the first down here or go for six points? Well, he surprises by uh, passing usually and in short yardage situations. This time a thrust by Phil Capra. And whether he dove over to get it or not, he was sent not back, but whether he picked it up or not, we shall see. They're looking toward the sidelines right now. It's going to be awful close. There's a disappointing looking uh, uh, Bob Ricker. He's trying to encourage his defense to hold fast at that point. But it appears as though the setters do have the first down, even though the officials are going to bring the chains back for measurement. That's what they're doing. They're just making uh, doubly sure, though, as Emerson said, it appears they have picked it up. Let's take a look with you. They've got it. First down. So that's a first down coming up. The ball nosing toward the 15-yard line and pace with a 12-0 lead and 8.25 to go in the third quarter on the march once again. Interceptions have certainly helped the setters cause this afternoon. They've been right on the spot. Tip passes nestling right in the setters' hands. They've been uh, opportunists this afternoon, uh, and uh, they have capitalized on two of those uh, turnovers. And a line this time to Marchetti. Marchetti keeps pounding off that left side. Couldn't find running room this time. Stopped by Cree. Now in the, uh, the Red Men lineup goes Carlos Tixiera. So that ball moved forward, oh, barely over a yard, just inside the 15, where it's, it's second, and let's make it nine to go. And the setters with Kevin Enterline at the helm. As, as an offensive player, I've always liked to have a ball inside the 20 with a first down and enough yards uh, getting down to the five to give you another first down and, and four cracks at it. Well, I can go with that idea, certainly. Wide pitch out. 
Theron back, and Theron back pulls his way just inside the five-yard line. That's exactly what I was talking about, Bob. Uh, the Redmen allowed the Fetters to come inside, pick up the needed yardage for the first down. Ball will be resting just about uh, at the five, but enough for the first down. On the, on the reverse uh, toss here, you watch uh, Theron back cut it inside. Tough piece of running. Knows where the first down marker is. Struggle fights his way for the first down. Tick Sierra had a shot at him, slipped away, and uh, you saw that fine run by Fehrenbach, so it's first and goal to go. And here with the slant off the right is Marchetti, but can't find any opening there as the Red Men are ready and willing to meet him. Brian Collins uh, just devoured the 5'7", 175 pounds Marchetti trying to get to the outside. Score 12 to nothing, pace leading, and we're in the uh, third quarter with 6.30 to go. Ball at the five-yard line, spread wide as Johnson on the left side, as Enderline calls the signals. Enderline looking, throwing to Johnson, and it is incomplete. Good breakup by number 27, Ken... Uh, uh, I'm really at Johnson doing a turnout on the outside and uh, really coming in to bat it away as you see a somewhat uh, maybe not disgusted look on on coach Mayer's face there but uh, he thought he had another six well the Redmen certainly uh, face now not only with stopping pace in this thrust but also coming back and we'll see a, a medal of their ability right now to withstand this pressure seeing how they do now in this third down and goal play is Enterline again looking for Johnson. A low pass there. knocked down. Ken Habriliak was right there in that low pass. And Johnson once again the intended receiver. It looks as though for a moment that, that uh, Habriliak had come up with the interception, but he was unable to hold on to the football. So we're at a fourth down situation, and Issa will now do the booting. The holding is Rich Poggi. That ball be placed at the 12, a 22-yard boot. It is up. It is good. So Pace now takes the lead of 15 to nothing. Well, I have to say this score is somewhat of a, a surprise, perhaps not to Pace University, but uh, certainly to any observer who has watched these two teams during the year. But for Pace, if they win, they topple the undefeated team. They go into a, a three-way tie for first place. They even their record if they win a three and two. St. John's record will also be three and two. And right now, Pace with a 15 to nothing lead, and St. John's is a long way to go with 6.05 to go in the third quarter. And as yet, the Redmen have not given signs of coming to life, have they, Emerson? Uh, no, they haven't. And what's even more shocking is that the center defense has played extremely well, uh, never having the real threat of the Redmen more than once all afternoon. And they're working on a shutout. Finn is the deep man. And Issa will be kicking off. That's a good kick that's going down to the 10-yard line. And that's Finn stopped at the 24 by Wojtusek. And we'll be back with more action here from St. John's. You're watching Liberty Conference football on Cablevision. Jerry, costs are going up and up as far as college education is concerned. How's Apple Bank trying to help defray some of those costs? We understand what's happening to educational costs, Barry, and at Apple Bank, we've devised a student loan program that helps the family budget. How can people find out about this program? All they need to do is to visit any one of our branches or call the student loan hotline number. Apple Bank for Savings, with five convenient locations on Long Island. Some days I'm so busy reading the defense, I don't have time for my morning paper. But when I can't read all about it, or I hear all about it. WCBS News Radio 88. Managing the Big Apple doesn't leave me much time to read the morning paper. Well, Sweet Lou has got a sweet solution. When I can't read all about it, I... 
I hear all about it. WCBS News Radio 88. Six minutes to go, third quarter, and paced with a 15 to nothing lead. Is it insurmountable? Well, that's what they'll play the rest of the game for to see. Issa with a 22-yard field goal. That last drive prior to the field goal, nine plays, 20 yards, took three minutes and 25 seconds. Bob Wolf, Emerson Boozer, Frank Cattali here at Redmond Field, where St. John's takes over the ball. And St. John's with an opener on the uh, right side of the line. Good opener that time for Christopher Finn. Find some running room. Don Dignan has been very much at evidence in the pace secondary, along with Peter Frank. Both of them outstanding. And now Sass leaves the lineup for the Red Men, and Jeff Ercolino takes his place for the Red Men. It's second and two at the 32. Look at that pace team. They almost went offside on that play. Opener netted thin, very little yardage as Tony Lucci was the first one to move in. The blitz defense has been great for uh, pace, haven't they? Uh, they have been blitzing an awful lot. Uh, they have shown a little bit of the 4-4, four, 4-6 four, uh, four, defense that was popularized by Buddy Ryan of the, of the Philadelphia Eagles when he was with the Bears. And that time, they, they brought the 4-4, four, four, bringing both linebackers in on the blitz and shut the door on number 22, Christopher Finn. Ball to 31 at second and three yards to go. St. John's battling the clock right now as well as the setters as they trail by a 15 to nothing score. Coster. That'll pick up the first down as well as extra yardage for O'Connell who moves the ball right now to the 45 yard line before Dignan again is in there for the stop. This so, is probably the first time we've seen him work uh, to uh, O'Connell, Andy O'Connell, and we'll watch it again here. Last week, O'Connell was very effective in the entire ball game with his re receptions. Again, uh, Costa rolls out to his right, slows up, finds number 30, O'Connell. A nice piece of running here after catching the football. It looked as though for a moment that he might get an awful lot of yardage out of here. First down for the Red Men, the ball at the 45-yard line. And once again, a little pass to the left to Santis but he was unable to haul it in. So that brings up a second and 10. Coming out of the backfield, that's a very difficult pass for back to catch, even though the Manny DeSantis dropped the football, but it's not an easy catch. Indeed, you don't. Uh, uh, when a receiver drops a ball like that, be it a running back or a split in any receiver out in the open, wide open, no defender around, you need some place to crawl under. You wish the uh, painted lines were a little bit uh, uh, thicker so you can pull one up and get under. Coster has thrown 24 times today, nine completions, 104 yards, but the big item is four interceptions. This is Sass. Oh, he was just sort of upended on that play. Dignan again was over there. He's coming up with a lot of tackles, and Sass was just sort of thrown up and down. <laughs> Looked like a wrestling move there. That was uh, Don Dignan that uh, got a hold of number 81, Tony Sass. Uh, Bigman caught a hold of an ankle and just flipped it out from under him as he, as he was trying to elude the tackle. That's another first down for the Red Men. This time they're nosing toward the 40-yard line. Ercolino is now wide on the left side for St. John's, number 16. Using the, uh, the two setbacks. Over the middle, incomplete to Finn. That was a quick little pass play without very much time to throw it before they burst in on Paul Coster. The setters are giving uh, the Redmen all the pressure they can take today. And I must remind you that the setters are not a big uh, defensive nor offensive line team. Just a, a shade smaller than uh, the Redmen up front. Redmen go a uh, good size. Uh, Monte Leone at 205. Uh, Height uh, at 205. O'Connell at 270. Uh, Porzelt at 210. O'Connell is wide right. Sass is wide left. Operating out of the eye now. Ercolino has gone to the sidelines. The look, the throw to O'Connell, and he has it at the 30, oh, fumbles no. the ball. There's a flag. Waiting for the indication. It appeared the pace was there to take over. And they have. 
That has been the trademark of the Redmen all afternoon. If they're not turning the football over, uh, the centers are taking it away. We watch again here as Costa rolls out to his right. He seems to like to go to his right a lot. And he looks downfield, finds O'Connell. And uh, in, in his attempt to get the extra yards, he really doesn't tuck the football away. In teaching receivers and backs and get to catch the football, the first rule of thumb is to catch it, then put it away before making a step. And the loss on that play, Marchetti, the ball carrier. By the way, we should salute on that, uh, that fumble was caused by Dan McKenna. You may have recalled number 44 came in and, and wrapped his arms around O'Connell and jostled the ball free. I'm sure to George Mayer's liking. So it's second and 15 to go, and the ball right now is resting on the 20-yard line. Pace leading by a score of 50 nothing, 2.45 to go in the third quarter. Pace is really up for this game, no question about that. The pass intended for Dan Rena, number 85, sailing out of bounds. That'll make it third and 15. Ball remaining at the 20-yard line. Every time that St. John's today has generated some sort of offense and appear to be on the move, Either a fumble, an interception, a ball batted up in the air, coming down in pace possession. But certainly pace is thwarted every thrust that the Redmen have made, and that's why the Redmen right now are being blanked. 15-0, 2.35 to go third quarter. Once they get a look at the game films of this particular ball game next week, they're going to see that uh, they have caused a lot of these things that have happened to them uh, themselves. Great pursuit. Fine tackle by Lou Monty, number 35. And that was a fumble rule by the official down at the five or six yard line covered by the Redmond. And uh, they've got their first big break of the afternoon. Even though they've had some turnovers, but this is their, their, their monstrous one here with the ball down inside the 10. Now you saw it was run over the goal line, but in the college rules, you cannot pick up the fumble and run the ball over. Again, watch it here as Interline rolls out to his right and finds that his pocket has collapsed at the point of attack. And uh, Lou Monty chases him back. He actually loses the football before hitting the ground. The Redmen recognize the loose football, pounced on it, and it's their ball at the six-yard line. Now, here's the big break. The six-yard line. It's first and goal to go for the Redmen. Monty gave him that big opportunity right now with his fine pressure as he came in to make the tackle and knock the ball free. Pass, incomplete intended for Sass, and he looked like he was in a little trouble with the defenders to whether to keep moving or, or actually move deeper or come in shorter. I think Sass thought that he was interfered with and thought he'd get the interference call down near the goal line, but uh, the officials were there right on top of it and uh, ruled it good. Second and goal. Little anticipation, getting all set for what could be a touchdown play. Looks like she's poised, ready to shoot. Now, O'Connell has moved wide to the uh, right this time. Sass on the left. In the tee, it's second and goal to go. The ball at the six-yard line. The Redmen trail by a score of 15 to nothing. Oh, fumble. Who's going to pick it up? Well, this is one they'll have to untangle. And it's St. John's ball. They recovered. Again, Bob, what happened here is that Costa uh, saw the blitz coming from the pace that is pulled out a little bit too soon, uh, a little bit uh, before securing the football, left it uh, between the legs of the center and almost turned into to disaster. It's third now and eight to go. Pace holding. DeSantis moves in the backfield now for the Redmen. And here is a uh, timeout call as Costa wants to come over and speak to Bob Ricca. This is an opportunity that the Redmen do not want to miss. Smart. So it's a St. John's timeout. Smart move by Costa. Uh, getting down here, you want to make sure you're on the same page because this center defense has posed a lot of problems for Costa and his offense. They've been moving in and out. As soon as Costa starts to call the signals, you'll see him moving in and out, stunning, blitzing. They've been uh, really a most active defense. There's only one way to stop uh, 
the pace defense from coming in late like that, and that is to go with the no huddle, hurry up offense. The same kind of offense that the setters used against the Redmond early in the uh, early in the first quarter, and uh, that was basically to not allow St. John's to get into a defense, shift into another, and that's what the Redmond are going to have to do. Come out of the huddle right now, snap, make uh, the setters declare themselves right away. It's third down coming up now for St. John's. The ball pressed back to the eight-yard line. Third and goal to go. We're under the two-minute mark in the third quarter and Pace holding a 15-0 lead. Wide outs on either side. Slot back on the left. Costa has the ball knocked out of his arms. Was it incomplete? Yes. They say it was incomplete, and that was close. He was going back to pass. Didn't bring the arm up too far. It didn't appear, but it was knocked out as he was bringing it up, so it's an incompletion. Neil Morgenstern was the one who gave him the big rush. And you've got to say that the Pace's defense has just been outstanding. It's been marvelous. They stood tall, not allowing uh, the touchdown down here, so we'll see uh, what will happen on the Google attempt from the uh, Procario. So Procario is out there. That ball will be slotted right now at the uh, 17, a 27-yard boot by Procario. Let's see if it works or not. Flag on the play. There's the boot. Couple of flags. Looked like Pace was offside as they came in. Mastered by Bob Shepard has just come over here. The, the, mate, the Mets have won the ball game in the bottom of the ninth inning. Bob Shepard handling the PA. Offside called against Pace University. And that ball being moved closer to the goal line now. So. That ball slotted at the five. Did you see an indication as to whether or not the kick was good or, or not? Did you? Yes, I did, uh, Bob. I thought the kick was good. Uh, had lots of height on it and plenty of leg. Here's the boot. This is up. And it is good. So St. John's is on the scoreboard. Averting the shutout. 15 to 3. In fact, St. John's had not been shut out since going varsity in 1978. 84 games over that span, and they've averted that now. Now their next hope is to come up with the victory. I dare say, actually, on, on that kick, although it may have been looked good from this angle, the chances are, although we didn't see an indication that it, it had not gone over, otherwise they would have accepted the kick right there for the three points, right? Indeed, but uh, the official ruled that they had uh, blown the, the play dead before the kick, well, nullifying uh, any upright kick of it. So that's the reason for the uh, doing the kick over again, and this time Tricario left no doubt about it as he put it up and right over that crossbar with plenty to spare. And here's Tricario's kickoff. Carries down all the way to the two-yard line where Rich Johnson is the ball. And Johnson is spilled at the 25. Here's Frank Curtelli on the sidelines. Frank. I'd like to remind you that this copyrighted telecast is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of Cablevision is prohibited. You need a new headdress, my friend. I have more feathers. Bob? Very good, Frank. Uh, disclaimer done in a uh, rather unique fashion. Augie Marchetti carrying the ball. Time left to go, a minute and 20 seconds here in this third quarter. It's 15-3. Now, in this drive here, we'll see if the center offense really want this ball game because what they'd have to do in this drive, if you see the St. John scoring drive, four plays, uh, two yards, uh, 48 seconds something to do that. Uh, getting back to, uh, to the setters, they've got to go down now and get three points or a six-pointer. Capra finds running room. 
That Cacario field goal, 22 yarder, took four plays, 48 uh, seconds. Pace leading 15 to three against the Redmen. And we've got uh, an injured player on the field for a Pace University. There's a concern, Coach George Mayer, as he watches one of his offensive linemen uh, lie on the Omni turf. We're down under a minute to go now. We have 52 seconds left to go here in this third quarter. We'll spot that number for you just as, as soon as we can, but obviously there there is concern. It may be uh, Joe Gamma, but we uh, we don't want to confirm this yet because we're not getting uh, too good a look at the moment. But one thing is for sure, everything has come to a, a complete stop right now. Is the condition of the injured player takes precedence over anything else. There appears to be no movement at all. Well, you just have a, at least his legs uh, are raised. So that's a good sign there. Well, while he's being attended to, we'd like to, to tell you about some of our upcoming games which will be taking place. And here they are, coming up on Cablevision. October 18th, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at, against St. John's. And October 25th, St. John's against CW Post. So we've got a couple of big games for you to look forward to. That's what's coming up on your Cablevision schedule in the next couple of weeks ahead. Also, while we have this opportunity, just like to tell you some of the people have been aiding us up here in the booth. Stu Honick with his fine statistical assistance. Mark Ridge helping out from St. John's and John Balcom, Pace University, their SID. It was Joe Gamma. And he appears to be all right now. And now back to the action as the ball is moved forward to the 43-yard uh, line by Rich Johnson. Down coming up as we look across the field is second. We have eight to go. The ball now at the 43. Score 15 to three. Favor of Pace University with 38 seconds to go. Third quarter. Quick pass off to the side to Johnson. Very little yardage, whoever. Tackled by John Krug, number 45. And that moves us down to 32 seconds to go in this third period of play. Third and six. Bob DePoto at the controls once again for a production and direction. And this is the opening of the Omniture Field here at St. John's at Redmond Field. Now it's a third and five. They look the throw to Rita, intercepted. Mark, uh, Ken Hagriliak with the interception, and that stops the clock with 24 seconds to go. That was a gamble by Interline, as you will watch it again here. He's trying to get the ball down to Dan Rena. Watch him as he roll here, and we can't really see downfield here, but uh, he wanted to lead Number 85, Rena, a little bit more. But have really I diagnosed it very well. Ball thrown a little bit short instead of the lead he should have had on it and uh, picked off. That was the fifth interception. And as we move back to the line of scrimmage with 24 seconds to go. Third quarter, St. John's Redmond trailing 15 to three. The ball to 47 where it's first and 10. Notice the way that Pace moves in and out of that line. This time they're called for it. That's a look at the, the famed 46 defense. As you see them line up, uh, both tackles over the, over the guards and the defensive ends out over the tackles. And the two inside linebackers are moved out. And then just before the snap of the ball, they're moving into the gaps. We mentioned just a few quarters ago, in order for the Redmen not to get caught that way, that time one of their offensive linemen 
got caught on movement when both guard, both the linebackers moved into the gap for the blitz. They better come out, hurt, snap right now, force the setters into declaring themselves. So the illegal procedure, knocking off the penalty, and the long pass by Costa to Weisenberger is out of bounds. Bealing was back there doing the job as the cornerback moving over. And they were looking for the mismatch uh, on Bealing to that side. Reiner at 6'2", 200 pounds, uh, as opposed to 5'9", 185 pounds. Both these quarterbacks have had their woes with interceptions and tip passes. Edeline, that was his fifth interception of the afternoon. Right now, the ball is at the 42. We're down to 16 seconds to go in this third quarter. And the down coming up. It's first 15 with the uh, runoff, the penalty. Ball slotted back at the 32 on the hold by the Redmond. So it's now first and 25 to go. That's how not to win. Uh, when you come up with the good movement of the football, you come up with a big penalty or an infraction, uh, you're digging a hole for yourself. Custer almost tripped, throws down the middle. That was a pass piercing through heavy traffic to Andy O'Connell. And O'Connell at the 43-yard line. He's brought down there by Tony Lucci. And here's a replay of that, that pass play. Look again here, O'Connell comes off from the left side of your screen as Costa seems to stumble a little bit going back to his pocket. Number 30, O'Connell comes across. Number 50, Lucy comes in to make the tackle along with uh, Neil Morgenstern. And that's the end of the quarter. We'll be back with the fourth quarter in a moment. You're watching Liberty Conference football on Cablevision. International, in association with Barbaro Contracting in Brooklyn, are pleased to participate in the Liberty Football Conference. OmniTurf, an athletic surface system designed with a commitment to provide the sporting world with a better place to play. OmniTurf combines the durability, consistency, and low maintenance of a synthetic surface together with the playability and feel of natural grass at its best. OmniTurf is the start of a new generation in sports surfacing. Sportech and Barbaro Contractors, a proud sponsor of the Liberty Conference. How do you define romance? The Q Motor Inn, Grand Central Parkway Service Road in Union Turnpike in Kew Gardens, Queens, is the definition of romance. The Q features free videotape recorders in every room, lovely fresh flowers, and the most romantic rooms anywhere. Paradise awaits the two of you at the Q. The Q Motor Inn is the definition of romance. Here's the fourth quarter. Bob Wolf, Emerson Boozer, Frank Cretali. Paul Coster has gone 12 for 30 today for 143 yards. He's had four interceptions. And this one tipped as it went out, intended for Christopher Finn, pressured by Rich Middlebrook. Rich Middlebrook, an academic All-American candidate. 5-9, 210-pounder, comes from Hackens, Hackettstown, New Jersey. So that means we have a third down coming up, 14 to go, and Tosantis, number 33, re-enters the game. He replaces Hill. This time O'Connell is wide to the right side. They look for O'Connell, and they throw to O'Connell. There's a flag on the play. O'Connell is finally brought down on the 42-yard line. And let's see what the penalty will be on this one, as O'Connell was the receiver moving from the right side right across the middle for the reception. Emerson? The call is going to be face-masking against the setters. As O'Connell, we watch here, that is the call. First down face masking. Let's see if we can see the replay. O'Connell have come across from the right side of your screen as Costa goes back to his pocket. He sets up here, spots O'Connell on a crossing pattern, picks up the ball. Now the face masking might have occurred right there and the flag should be coming in uh, right now. There it is. That's a first down coming up for the Redmen. The ball now is at the 25-yard line where early in this fourth quarter, 
And although pace has dominated the game to this point, taking advantage of every opportunity, defensively and offensively, right now the Redmen are in excellent position. And, of course, if they can score, they'll be right back. It'll be anybody's ball game. Long way to go, and they trail by 12. O'Connell is wide to the right once again. Sass on the left. They look to O'Connell. They throw to O'Connell. O'Connell has... Oh, he dropped the ball. It was in his hands, and he dropped it. Beautiful pattern by Andy O'Connell, number 30. Good throw by Costa, and uh, just could not hold on to the football. Beal had good coverage on him, but he had been beaten by Andy O'Connell. We'll watch it again, and you be the judge in the replay as Costa sets up just outside of his pocket and leads... O'Connell beautifully, and he just does not keep his eyes on the football and dropping it. Beeling was there to cover, but oh, O'Connell was free, and that's one I'm sure he'll be thinking about after the ball game, win or lose. This time again, the look toward O'Connell, and the throw to O'Connell, and this time he's got it. A good catch on a low pass, and that ball has now moved forward to the 14-yard line. That's a confidence builder there, Bob. Uh, you throw the uh, look seemingly sure touchdown to O'Connell on the play prior to that one, and he drops it. You come right back with a turn in, and here is that second play, the turn in over the middle here to O'Connell. Ball is dying like a quail, but O'Connell gets down there with it, picks it up for the first down. A first and 10 at the 14-yard line. Hill is now back in the lineup. So O'Connell came right back with a fine reception. This time he's spread out wide to the right side. Coster always rolls to the right. He throws, and it is knocked down. Good breakup by number 12, Neil Morgenstern. It appears as though 89 there. Uh, Weisenberger had uh, the sure touchdown, but out from nowhere came Morgenstern to bat it away. And as we've noticed, and Emerson commented, Costa really always rolls to his right, doesn't he? Indeed he does. He, he, I think he feels more comfortable being a right-handed passer, uh, rolling to his right and throwing. It would be very difficult for him to roll left. He has to stop now and set up uh, by planting the left foot, right foot back to throw the football. It's second and 10 at the 13-yard line. St. John's on the move early in this fourth quarter. Again, Costa rolling to the right. Again, looks, he throws toward O'Connell, he jumps, he's got it for a touchdown. That time O'Connell makes the difficult catch. He takes uh, Doug Beeley all the way across the field, and it uh, looks as though at one point he was throwing to number 81, Tony Sass, but uh, then I see O'Connell coming to the pitcher with Beal trailing, and uh, O'Connell just goes up, out fights uh, Beal for the football, we have a five-point ball game if the extra point is hit. And O'Connell was truly surrounded that time. There were a lot of pace defenders around, but O'Connell was there to score. Cricario will do the booting. Nealon will hold. Score right now, 15 to 9. The snap, the kick, it is up. A good one. It's way up to the uh, uprights. And the extra point is added. So it's a 15 to 10 ball game. Well, St. John's has come right back. We have ourselves a ball game here. Uh, we started to tighten up. Let's take another look here at the touchdown as uh, Costa rolls out to his right, throws back across the green, which is almost taboo into a crowd. But watch O'Connell go up fighting for the football. Bill is back into your right, number 34. We'll take a look at it again here. Peter Frank was actually closest as we watch again here, I want Joe Connell go up fighting along with number 34, Peter Frank, for the football. He's holding it aloft to say, hey, I've got it. <laughs> and he did have it. Well, it's a close one now. All of a sudden, pace has come back. Cricario will kick off, and Bueling and Johnson are the two deep men. And the kick is a low one, a bouncer. McKenna's there. He finally falls on it. So Dan McKenna, number 44, finally decided he better fall on it. Well, that ball was um, jumping around. And that's the proper thing to do. Once you cannot get the handle on the football, somebody's going to have to secure it by pouncing on it. And uh, when you pounce, you've got to have somewhat, somewhat of a soft, soft pounce because 
And a football is a funny bouncer. It will slide out from under you. Well, we've got the, the coach picking up the troops down there. Exactly uh, what they got to do when they go back in on offense. That quick opener, Dan Rena was in. Mike Maddich. The uh, pass was a 13-yard pass from Costa to O'Connell. The carry -o kick took seven plays, 47 yards in a minute and 53 seconds to pull the Redmen within five of pace. Now we have a second and nine to go for the setters. Two wide outs, the single back behind the quarterback, Edeline. Edeline down the middle. Oh, take it off. The interception. Argenti is finally filled. Big play for the Redmond. I don't know who uh, Edeline was trying to throw the football to, but we do have uh, a, a penalty flag on the ground that has been picked up by the official. And uh, we don't know what the call might have been, but an excellent uh, interception by Mike Argini. Big turnover for the Redmen. We'll watch it again here and see if we can find out who Inline was trying to get the ball to. As you'll see, number 52 just stands right in his track. He was trying to come to Rich Johnson on a turn-in and uh, didn't wait until he cleared the lane, so to speak, and the ball landed in the hands of Mike Argini. Who last year was... Um Apple Bank defensive player of the game. A 30, 32 yard interception return. And the sixth interception in which Edeline is intercepted. This time he's thrown by Malstadt, number 76. So Edeline has thrown six interceptions. Big play for the setters there. They are really coming after uh, Paul Costa here. They come in off to the right of your screen here. You'll see number 76, Malstadt, Tom Malstadt, come in right now and pounce on Costa. It's second, 18 to go. The ball right now is at the 33-yard line, and the Redmen trailing 15 to 10. Jeff Ercolino is now in, and he's spread on the right side. Looking for Sass, throwing to Sass, overthrown. Sass in the corner. Being pursued by 28, Brian Conboy. The reason he missed uh, missed, missed uh, Sass that time, Costa rolling to his left, really didn't have a chance to set up. He tried to throw off the uh, lead foot and uh, got too much zip onto the football. That makes it a third down play. Ball at the 28-yard line. Third, 17 to go. Andy O'Connell back in the lineup now for the Redmen. The play to come with Bob but right now is to come back with the same kind of play he just had, rolling, and uh, this time he must set up. And Precario is getting set for use if needed. Oscar goes down. Stone for a slight loss by McKenna and Morgenstern. And I wonder what uh, Bob Rickle was saying to his troops. I'm sure Frank Cortelli knows. Frank, were you covering? Uh, Bob, just before that oh. interception by Argeni, I was uh, leaning into the huddle, and Rickle wants basically what they want. Whoever's at fullback, they want that fullback to pick up Richie Middlebrook because uh, oh, no. according to Rickle, they're not picking him up. They have to stop him. They have to get some sort of pass protection. So Costa's going to throw the way he's been throwing last week, and if he wants to pick it up, the St. John seems to be get, getting going, and uh, that's what they have to do. Fullback pick up Middlebrook. Bob? Good. Thank you, Frank. We've got a timeout right now. 11.28 to go in this fourth quarter. The score 15 to 10 as the uh, pace setters are out in front in this very close ball game. It's become closer. Emerson? What the setters have shown here in this drive, uh, even though they turned the football, the offense turned the football over to the Redmond. The defense have denied any movement by the Redmond, forcing them to go for the extra point. As a matter of fact, they they made them uh, lose 10 yards in that drive. Well, this is a a big play coming up right now. We have a fourth down situation. It's fourth and 19. The ball just at the 30-yard line for the St. John's Redmen. And although time is not necessarily a factor, as the musicians 
add to the color and excitement of this afternoon. What Coach Mayer wants to do, too, in this kind of situation is watch out for all trickery uh, from Coach Ricker. So Tricario is getting set to kick. He'll be kicking from the uh, 37, which will be a 47-yard boot. Nealon is, is holding. And I think he can hit it here. Here's the kick. Let's see what happens. Looks like it's short. It is short, and it'll be run out by Beeling. He's going to run it out. He's at the 10 and knocked out of bounds as he approaches the 15, and there's a flag on the play. So a little gamble entailed in bringing the ball out that time. <laughs> that was a little gamble. That is a big gamble. As the officials consult on the play, time left to go, 11-17 in the game. And the penalty against uh, Pace. Instead of uh, having the ball at the 40-yard line, you're going to have it starting roughly around the 6-yard line. Up. Oh. The carrier saying, ah, tuck, gun, short. <laughs> <laughs> A whole lot short. Yeah. So they're at the six-yard line after the hole, and it's first and ten to go from the six-yard line for a pace. I don't think Doug Beeling was instructed to run that one out. I wouldn't think so, but it was too late to get a message in, wasn't it? So Edeline takes over that quarterback slot and the handoff to Marchetti. Marchetti is dumped after picking up a yard. Mike Maddich burrows in for the stop for the Redmen. Score, 15 to 10, pace. Okay, the Redmen are going to have to keep the setters pinned down into this territory if they are to turn the football over in good field position to the offensive unit. But on the other side, uh, the setters' offense is going to be thinking about six points. Fehrenbach is way out on the right side, very wide over there. And they're looking for Fehrenbach. They throw to him, and he's got the ball on that sideline. Knocked out of bounds. Kavriliak knocked him out of bounds. Good-looking uh, play by Interline, getting outside with a little pressure on him. Uh, found uh, it's one of his favorite receivers, uh, number seven, Fahrenbach. Take another look at it here in our replay. Uh, as you see, Interline rolls out to his right. Uh, really outruns one of his blockers uh, at this point here. Now the pressure starts to come. Looks downfield, finds number seven, Fahrenbach. And Fahrenbach looks to be off to the races there for a moment. That was a 19-yard pass play, good for a first down. The ball now at the 26-yard line in pace territory. This opener to Marchetti. And he moves for very short yardage. Could have been a big play for number 75, Brian Collins at that time. He saw the counter play coming from the backside. We're really coming right at him, but he overran the play, just could not get a piece of the ball carry, Marchetti. Changes now made in, along the St. John's line as Dunnigan leaves. Now with a second down coming up, we have second and eight to go. The ball at the 28-yard line. This time it's Johnson who is wide on the left-hand side. Second and eight. A look toward Johnson and a throw over Johnson's head. There's a flag, however, on this play. There's going to be a call of holding, Bob, on number 33, Phil Capra. He looked to have, uh, have held uh, Brian Norton. I, I remember that very well because I used to make that similar kind of hold on some of those big defensive ends. I know what happened to him. Hey, what's a similar <laughs> type of hold you made, Anderson? You try to come in tight to the legs, and you take your fingers with a short arm, uh, elbow, elbow clutch to the waist, or to the sides and just let your fingers go out and grab a piece of the sock hoping they fall and nobody would see it. <laughs> they never spotted you there, <laughs> did they? Oh, yeah. I got caught once in 10 years with that maneuver. <laughs> the specialized art, no doubt. Oh, yes. That ball spotted right now at the 18-yard yeah. line where it's third down coming up. The call was holding. Make that second, second and 18 to go. I am sure it was Capra who did the holding. So second and 18 at the 18. Shotgun. Pass down the middle, and the receiver is Rick Pogey. Number 41. 
Okay, that was no doubt in his mind, meaning uh, in line where he was going to. He was going to number 41, Rich Posey, and he did that thing in a hurry, streaking down the middle, right between the seams, delivered the football there, almost come up with a first down. Now, out of the ball game for the uh, Redmen comes Michael Potestas, and Carlos Tixiera moves in the uh, lineup. The ball's at the 34, where it's third and two to go. Time left to go, nine minutes and 21 seconds. We've got a timeout on the field as Edeline goes over to speak to his coach once again. He, in, this, in this drive here with nine minutes and something to go, uh, both coaches, I'm sure Coach Mayer and along with his quarterback, Edeline, and probably the entire offensive unit, both on the field and side on the thinking, we've got to have at least minimum a three-point field goal. A six-pointer will give us the cushion we need to go in if we're going to preserve a victory here. We'll be back with more of this fourth quarter action in a moment. You're watching Liberty Conference Football on Cablevision. Here's a free pass to our next game. Thanks, Barry, and here's something free for you, a free Apple Bank checking account. Free? Absolutely free. No monthly maintenance charges, no per check charges, nothing. I can write all the checks I want at no cost? The only charge you'll get is out of Apple Bank's fine service. And we'll pay you five and a quarter percent interest on balances of $700 or more. Apple Bank for savings. We're good for you. Sullivan County Community College, a great start that never ends. A two-year SUNY with day and night classes, great career choices while you're making new friends. Communication, photography, a restaurant management and media arts, undeclared major, computer science, food service management, commercial art, sports, movies, concert and dance, or great social life and maybe romance. Sullivan County Community College, a place for fun, a place for knowledge. Sullivan County Community College, a place for fun, a place for knowledge. We're down to the last nine minutes and 21 seconds. The score remains 15 to 10, Pace leading St. John's. Pace with the ball. It's a third down play coming up. Third and two to go. The ball at the Pace 34-yard line. Edeline has gone 12 for 32 passing, 110 yards, six interceptions, and two touchdowns. This time we have wideouts left and right side. Pass to Johnson is complete. That picks up the first down. Stopped by John Cruz, along with Brian Norton. Excellent choice by in line coming to number one, Johnson, on a quick look in or a, a quick post or a slant. It has a number of names. Uh, I remember back in the uh, 50s and early 60s, it was called a look in. Not only do the names change throughout the years, but the coaches like to add their own variations of the names. Indeed. In fact, that's a good way of writing their new book, with all these new terms, and what, what's really going on, people want to know. Same old, same old me, but a different looking stew. Absolutely, head alive. And Nealon is in there for the stop. The ball right now is just at midfield. Second down coming up and four to go at the 50 yard line. Wide men on left and right, single back behind Edeline. Too far for Rob Fehrenbach. Thus far, Coach Mira has to be somewhat uh, pleased with his offense. They started it around the six-yard line. He has to be pleased for two reasons. Number one, they are moving the football. Number two, they are eating away at the time. Now a big play is coming up for Pace. It's a third down play. The ball is at midfield. If they can click on the third and four play, they can keep this drive going. As Emerson said, time a little over eight minutes to go right now. If not, they'll have to go back to a putting situation. We'll give the Redmen one more opportunity to come ahead uh, with a touchdown. So here's a big play, and the pass is incomplete. A great rush was put on that time by Lou Monty, number 35, who came rushing in against Edeline, rushed his pass, which fell incomplete. Also, that line is still on the ground there. It looks as though he just had the wind knocked out of him, but uh, cre uh, credit Lou Monty. Monty fought through a block to not allow uh, Interline to get around him outside to complete his pass. Outstanding play by Monty. 
That means we're in a fourth down situation, fourth and four, the ball at midfield. And back to boot goes Issa. In the safety spot is Tony Sass. So Pace will have to yield possession. Poor snap, picked up. Here's the kick. Kick is a good one. Sass waits, gathers it on the 14. Back to the 20, the 25, and down at the 28-yard line. So the Redmen take over, under eight minutes to go, trailing by five points in this last quarter. Now is the time for the Redmen, along with Costa, to get his offense rolling, because uh, uh, six-pointer here puts you in the lead by at least two points, so we see what our offense is made about. At the 29, it's first and 10. Lou Monty's brother also, Bob, played for Pace from 1980 to 83, part of the Monty tradition there. And in the eye, let's see how Costa does in the pitch out, this time to Finn. Finn across the uh, 30, picked up short yardage on the play. He spotted just inside the 30, and here's Frank Curtali. Frank? Thanks, Bob. I was just speaking with injured uh, running back John Casenza, who was hurt in last week's game, and he was talking with Paul Costa, and I said, John, what, are they, what does it look like they're going to do on this uh, drive? They're going to try to go to Sass, O'Connell, and Weisenberg. They're gonna be, Paul uh, Costa's going to sprint out and hit, uh, and hit Weisenberg going up the sideline, something they tried early in the, fir early in the game, but Paul just wasn't connecting with Big Jim Weisenberg, and they're going to try to get that going. Paul feels, uh, they feel that Paul's getting his arm back and his confidence back. And uh, there you see that reception Weisenberger. It looks like he's doing okay. Absolutely, and this time he had to really just uh, thread the needle along there because he caught it just barely inside the sideline. Now watch Weisenberg and see how close it comes. Emerson? Beautiful piece of information, Frank. Uh, called it just as you mentioned. He has a uh, look over his right shoulder. Weisenberger concentrates extremely well on it. He's both feet in bounds, catches the football, big game. So that's the strategy and as relayed by Frank Cretali. It paid off with a 26-yard pass play and a first down. DeSantis goes down. DeSantis was spilled by Eric Williams, number 95. It came bursting in for the stop. Big play by Williams, the defensive end, 5'9", 225, junior out of New Rochelle. Uh, that was just an outstanding play, a uh, loss of about a good six yards on that play. Where do the coaches go when they keep walking? They just build up the mileage? Maybe they get free trips somewhere if they build up enough uh, mileage credit. What do you think? Well, I, I think uh, the Liberty Conference should give him some because he has traveled up and down that sideline today, and that shows concern for his defensive unit and his entire squad. It shows a little bit worried. Absolutely. It's, it's tough to stay in one spot when you're really worried about what's happening. The pass, another beauty toward the sideline, this time to O'Connell. Beeling was there for the stop. Now, that time, number 22, uh, Finn, he did the kind of holding that I would normally do. He had it tucked in both tight, got a hold of the linebacker, popped him down, and there's no, no play. That's Boozer holding. <laughs> That's we, I'm me. getting a, a course in inside <laughs> football up here, Emerson. Uh, Finn, when he hears this, he will admit that he got the, he had both, uh, both elbows pinned to his side, got the fingers sticking out. He got himself a hold. I'm glad the officials it. weren't watching you except when you were running with the ball. 41-yard line. It's third and seven for the Redmen, who trail by five. 6.31 to go in this fourth quarter. Sass. Immediately pinned by Conboy. A quick pass over the middle. Moves the ball now to the 28-yard line. And that'll be another first down coming up. Again, you look at it here. A two-step drop, Costa delivers down to 81, Sass, big completion. Drive still alive. Ball at the 30th three, it's, it's first and 10 to go for the Redmen. And you can see now why George Mayer is pacing as the Redmen are moving down that field, battling the clock and battling pace. We're just at the six minute mark or thereabouts in this last period. Up. Oh. Coming in too quickly that time was Neil Morgan's turn, number 12, as he burst through the line. So the Redmen stay on the move. I think it's a bit uh, on, on Coach Mayer's mind, uh, a little deja vu from 85, leading 14-0 at Pace University. St. John's come back in the closing minutes, or in the fourth quarter, to score a touchdown, went for the two to get them, and beat them 14-15. Uh, in 85. 
apparently on this play, I guess there was a, a penalty on each side nullifying it. Sacked by Morgenstern there. So they took the play. Did he catch it? No. Ooh. He dropped it and picked it up. We'll take another look at it uh, for those that have doubt. Number 30, O'Connell goes down on an out. Ball is thrown a little bit too low. Gets the ball, did not uh, get control of it, dropped it. Incompletion. The ball to 34, it's third and 11. Well, this is a big possession series for the Redmen. You'd almost have to go for it here on fourth if they don't get it here. Big play coming up right now to O'Connell. He's got it. And O'Connell wrestled down, fumbles the ball, but they call the play dead before he yielded the ball up. Long way from the first down. It's going to be interesting to see what Coach Rickett does here. Will he go for the, will go on the fourth down? Watch it again here. Uh, Costa goes around. He's looking right away to uh, O'Connell. O'Connell makes the reception, but uh, Beeling makes the sure-handed tackle, holds him for any additional yardage. And, uh, Ball right now at the 31. Makes it the uh, 26, I should say. And it's fourth and three. So this could be the play of the game. It is at the point where Rickett could not uh, put it away. He has to go for the first down here. Up off the fingertips of Tony Sass, who made a dive for the ball, drawn up by Convoy, and possession is lost. Again, the ball was thrown a little bit too much out in front, and I think it's solely because Costa is not really uh, uh, an accurate passer as he rolls to his left because he doesn't really get a chance to set up over there. Friends, if you're looking to lease an automobile, Allstate Vehicle Leasing is the name to remember. Allstate Vehicle has the best service and the most competitive rates in the area. So if you're interested in leasing an automobile in the near future, Allstate Vehicle Leasing is the place to go. Allstate Vehicle Leasing, located on 4201 Northern Boulevard in Long Island City, or call 718-937-7500. Marchetti, and the time shows 4.36 as Marchetti is stopped by the center of the, the Red Men line. Brian Norton, number 19, got into the hole to close the gap to uh, shut down the progress of uh, Marchetti. Ball spotted right now at the 26-yard uh, line. We're at second and 10. Second and 10. Clock ticking away, four minutes and some seconds. The score pace. 15 and St. John's 10. Into line directing the pace attack. Another feed to Marchetti and another stop after picking up two yards off the left side by Brian Norton. Moves the ball closer to the 30 yard line. And the clock now moves under four minutes. It's three minutes and 45 seconds left to go. Third and seven yards to go. Good looking play that last play, a counter trap with uh, big George Dreyer coming pulling down on the block. So the ball slotted at the 29-yard line where it's third and seven. And the time shows three minutes and 25 seconds. Pace cheerleaders out on force this afternoon along with the, the St. John's Redmen and their contingent. Three minutes approaching and a line calling signals in a third and seven situation. Another thrust off the right side by Capra. This time he picks up three more yards off the right. That'll bring up a fourth down. And that means that if they go to a punt, as we presume they will, this will give the setters one last opportunity as we move under the three-minute mark, two minutes and 54 seconds. Okay, this gives the Redmond uh, credit. They have defensively stopped the setters from advancing the football now. Uh, we'll wait to punt right over the offense. And it's up to Paul Coster again to get on the board. So back goes Issa to punt. Back goes Sass to do the receiving as the Redmen will have one last chance to come from behind. Maybe more. Good boot. It's as Sass takes it in on the 28. He's at the 30. Running laterally. He's downed before going back to the 30-yard line by Rob Fahrenbach. 
And the Redmen, trailing by five, 15 to 10, have a little over two minutes. And they have to go about 70 yards to get there. Royale Sporting Goods is the leader in institutional sporting goods in the metropolitan New York area. For further information, call 718-256-5200. Now the Red Men, trailing 15-10, two minutes and 19 seconds. They have the ball at the 30. They're in the fourth quarter. They've got to go 70 yards. If they score, they move in front. If they fail on this march, Pace will have toppled them from the unbeaten ranks in the Liberty. Coster looking for Sass, throwing deep for Weisenberger. He's got the ball. Here's Weisenberger. He's at the 20. He's at the 10. Weisenberger scores. St. John's leads. Big touchdown for the Redmen. There is one thing we want to show you if we have this in a replay when Costa is rolling to his left. That time his offensive line afforded him enough time so that he could roll to his left, plant that left foot, set up with the right, and deliver the football downfield. That time it was done as we just described. He found number 89. His big tight end, Jim Weisenberger, delivered down for the sixth quarter. So St. John's on a 70-yard pass play to Weisenberger moves out in front with 2.07 showing on the clock, and they lead now by a score of 16 to 15. And here's the replay of the touchdown, which put the Redmen in front. Now here's the big difference in why this play was completed. Watch right there. He set up to the right leg, come back, delivers the football down to 89 Costa. And from this point on, it's a foot race as number 34 failed a Peter Frank frail to come up with a tackle. Now it's off to the races between Morgan Stern and Weisenberger. And Weisenberger goes in to score. And the Redmen, who have come back this afternoon, now lead by a score of 16 to 15. The two halves have been really reversals in the scoring and in the play. In the first half of the ball game, Aaron back, uh, Farron back on a six yard pass from Etteline, then Johnson on a 12 yard pass from Etteline, and Pace led by a score of 12 to nothing. And that's, of course, why George was pacing, George Mayer. Essa, with a 22 yard field goal, gave Pace a 15 nothing lead. It was at this point that Tricario finally got the Redmond on the scoreboard with a 22 yard field goal, 15 to 3. Then O'Connell. A 13-yard uh, pass from Coster. Trocario kick is good, 15 to 10. Now Weisenberger on the 70-yard touchdown play from Coster, and they're going for two right now. Charles Barberi has moved in the lineup, the uh, six-foot-eight receiver. And the pass to O'Connell, no good. Covered by Beeling. So. It's a one-point lead for the Redmen, 16 to 15, and now Pace has the chance to see what they can do with two minutes and seven seconds left to go in the game. Okay, the Redmen are going to be in their prevent defense as they have been in uh, sometimes this afternoon. That is three down linemen rushing, four linebackers, and uh, three defensive backs, or four defensive backs, to try to prevent either the three-pointer or the touchdown. That big play... 12 seconds in that one, 70 yards on that play. 70-yard pass. Costa to Weisenberger has given St. John's a lead, 16-15, after they had trailed in this ball game by a 15-0 score. Last year, you may recall, with something like five minutes and some seconds to go. At that time, we also saw Pace leading in the ball game, and St. John's with a pass to Barberi for a touchdown and then to Sass for the two-point conversion gave the Redmen last year a one-point win. Here's Precario's kick. It's a high one. It's going down to Johnson who takes it at the 16. And Johnson finds a little room as he gets over the 30 to the 33. And now Pace takes over with the scoreboard clock showing two minutes and two seconds left to go in the ball game. So we can expect the pass, the air to be filled with passes right now. Two oh two to go. First and ten. And the line has gone 14 for 35 passing. 
120 yards. The Redmen will be going with three down linemen rushing, even though no, they've got four coming. The spread offense with a shotgun and the pass in and out of the hands of Fehrenbach. Fehrenbach. Actually, he, he turned to look, didn't he? Yes, he did. He turned to look to see where the opposition was and uh, forgot his uh, rule of thumb, secure the football first before trying to run with it. So it's second and 10. The ball at the 33. Now Bob Nealon goes back in the lineup for the Redmen. And a really act to spread wide on the left, guarding Johnson, who has moved off as a wide man on the right-hand side, operating on the shotgun. On the left side, we have Krug on defense. And a line, looks, throws, and it is no good. Brian Norton was in there to break it up for the Red Men, intended for Rich Johnson. Norton anticipated that one very well, thought he might have had the interception as he came up from his uh, deep free safety position and uh, just could not uh, handle the football. Now it's at the 33 where it's third and 10. This is another one of those crucial plays with a minute 49 to go. The Redmen in front by a point, 16 to 15. And again, we have everybody spread wide except for the uh, quarterback who's operating on the shotgun, hoping to find one of those wide receivers on both sides. Now the Redmen go into that three-man rush. There's a long pass going deep down field of Fehrenbach, and it's just to the side of Fehrenbach. That was a long pass guarded by Darren Pohornik on that play. And that means we're down to a fourth down situation. Fourth and 10, the ball to 33. And this appears to be almost a, a last gasp for the pace setters unless something takes place. And St. John's fumbles or loses the ball in some way or is stopped with timeouts taking their toll because a minute 41 can take a long, long time. But as far as possession goes right now, for pace, it's fourth and 10. They're 33. So let's see how Edeline fares this time. Looks over the defense, calling out the signals so it can be heard. Looks. Keeps. Throws, hits his man, and it is a first down as Rich Johnson has picked up the first down. That is new life into the offense of the pace setters. Credit to Interline for finding the open man, and uh, Rich Johnson should have gotten out of bounds immediately, stopping the clock. Once again in our replay, as uh, Interline sets back, looks downfield, buys time by moving out of the pocket. Now he's being chased. He gets over to the left side, finds Johnson upfield for the big first down and more likely to this offense. And he couldn't get out of bounds, so they had to call a timeout to stop the clock. As we have George uh, Mayer and Edeline discussing things, it's at the 49-yard line on a 16-yard pass play. It's first and 10, and the time on the clock, 1 minute and 32 seconds. After a rather a slow first half, as far as the, the bigger... Uh, certainly if St. John's was concerned, not a pace. Uh, this second half has really become a sight to behold, Emerson. Uh, St. John's has only played football uh, uh, one quarter today. I think uh, pace has come out. Uh, they sputtered in the first quarter, picked up the pace second and third quarter. And even in the fourth, the defense has played extremely well. Well, right now the pressure is on for both teams. The Red Men on defense. Pace with the ball on offense. They've got 51 yards, they've got to go if they want to score and regain the lead, or of course they can get close enough to try for that field goal. Let's see what takes place. Operating out of the shotgun with everybody spread wide. And there's one down the center, is complete. Complete to Dan Rena. Picks up short yardage on this play, and the ball will be spotted at the 45 yard line. Time left to go is a minute and 24 seconds. It'll be a second down coming up and four yards to go. Mike Maddich was in there for the stop. Clock shows a minute 15. The clock is moving. Approaching the minute to go mark. It's second and four at the 45. And a line. Down the middle to Fehrenbach, but it's grabbed in front of Fehrenbach by Dan Rina, who went high in the air to haul it in. A beautiful play by Dan Rina. But we've got a flag on the play. And it appears it will be against Pace. Thank you. 
a holding penalty against Pace, and that could be the most important penalty of the game. And that is a big one. It uh, takes the wind out of the sail of the setters. So what they've got to do now is say, heck, it's done. Let's regroup, let's regroup and strike again. This not only uh, hurt them from the standpoint of being on the march, but has taken them away from what could be field goal territory now on the hold. So we have a minute and two seconds left to go. It's now second and 14. The ball is the 45-yard line. They still have passing opportunities, and the clock is now running. It's down to 55 seconds. It's picking off the time. We're down now to 50 seconds to play. Signals being barked with under 50 seconds to go in this last quarter as Enterline looks, and Enterline throws, and it's Farron back going up the ball off his fingers and down to the ground incomplete. Started by Brian Norton on the play, and the clock stops with the incompletion with 41 seconds left to go. Ball should have been caught, just did not hold on to it as Fahrenbach went up to make the reception, bounced into his hands and then uh, over his head. Watch it again here as Interline delivers right down the pike. There he goes up for the football. The uh, ball is coming a little bit behind him, but any time the ball hits you within those uh, eight fingers and two thumbs, it should be uh, caught. So that means we're at the 45-yard line where it is third and 14. Time left to go, 41 seconds in the ball game. Again, the receivers are spread right and left. Back it goes to Edeline. Edeline being rushed, Edeline being pursued. Can he get the pass off? He works, he throws, incomplete. Kenneth Johnson, who was just a, a safety gap on that one. And we're down out of the fourth down coming up. It'll be fourth and 14, and the time left to go on the scoreboard clock, 32 seconds in the ball game. So this is the play right now. This will make it happen or it won't make it happen as far as pace staying alive. This is the play. We're right down to this in this ball game. St. John's leads 16 to 15. Here you see George Mayer looking on. You can tell the, the tumult and the turmoil that's going to him right now. That penalty was so costly. Now we're down to one last gasp for the pace setters with the ball right now at the 45 in their own territory. There's the pass toward the sideline. It is caught and taken out of bounds. A beautiful play by Rich Johnson. The Last. clock now shows 25 seconds to go. Now let's see where they spot that ball because we're looking over toward that, uh, that first down marker. It's a, a first down coming up for Pace. They barely made it and the ball's at the 41. It shows you where uh, he placed his confidence in the last two times on fourth down, uh, the first time going to number one, Rich Johnson. And on this attempt, fourth down, he looks for number one, Rich Johnson. That ball's at the 41, and this battle against time, it's at 25 seconds left to go. We're in Redmond territory now at the 41. Too far, of course, right now for a field goal. And of course, they, if they get a pass, they want to get it out of bounds as quickly as they can because time is running down. Enterline looking back, the seconds are ticking away. There's a pass to Johnson. He's got the ball, and Johnson is downed at the 22-yard line, and timeout is called with 17 seconds to go. Okay, you've got time enough to run at least one more play, uh, but you've got to make sure you've got enough timeouts to get your kicking team out on the field, and I think it should be warmed up. It appears as though now with all these substitutions that uh, Coach Mayer is going for the field goal here. So he's going to go for it right now as Isis come on the field. We watch again here on the replay of Interline finding his favorite receiver in the late goings, number one, Rich Johnson. As Johnson does a streak and turn in, goes up for the football, makes an excellent catch, and upon hitting the ground, there's a fine piece of running. But more importantly, when he knows that he's getting here, watch him tuck the ball away. That was the key to it all right there. Now, Issa is getting set. And that ball will be spotted at the 29, a 39-yard field goal attempt, 17 seconds to go. This will do it one way or the other. This is the ball game wrapped up with this boot right now. Everybody, the winner or the loser. Everybody are holding on to their hearts. To this, <laughs> including us. leap out if he hits this thing. Here's the kick. It is short.
a dejected Pace University team walking off the field. That was a great rush that the Redmen put on that time. Here's the coach. You can tell his dejection just looking at him. There didn't seem to be much time to get that ball slotted in there, did there, Emerson, on that uh, field goal attempt? No, there didn't, but it shows here in the closing minutes. Uh, as we see, the setters slowly stroll to the sideline that they wanted this ball game awfully bad. They worked all, all week with one thing in mind, that is coming down, spoiling the opening day for St. John's on his omniturf. And that one, it seemed to be a little difficulty in, in getting that ball down and, and spotted for, for the kick. It appeared to be rushed to compensate. St. John's, of course, occasion that the way they came in so quickly, they take over right now, and they have just 12 seconds left to go to run out the clock, which they are doing right now as the seconds are ticking away. The countdown is now to seven to seven seconds. Timeout is called right now. You can see pace. If there's anything which shows the feeling, the emotion of the game, I mean, you can just, the pictures and, and the, the, the sobbing is just heartfelt emotion. That's, that's Dan Reno that we sit over there, but it could be any one of his teammates Along with them over there, we see also Dick Andrzejewski, but it could be any one of them because one of the things that you know about a football game or any sport is the elation of winning, but the despondency of losing, and it's all over. This game has run its course. You have to salute St. John's after a lethargic first half. They came racing back after trailing by a 50-0 score, and somehow on that last play to Weisenberg, or a 70-yard play, came out victorious, 16 to 15. Talk about excitement, we had it. Talk about dejection, that's pace. Triumph, St. John's, but these two teams both can be congratulated for an excellent performance. Here is the tough part of the game here, so you watch the players line up to uh, come by in, in unison and single line to congratulate each other. Uh, as a player, I just would not get any gratification uh, being near the opposition after losing such a close ball game. Well, there's no question what's in their hearts is not what they evident. I guess it's an act of sportsmanship, but it takes force to go through with something like this because when you've lost a game like this, it's a difficult thing to do. But it's a sporting thing to do, and it's part of the collegiate scene. But as you said, inside, a loss is a loss and a win is a win and it takes a long time sometimes years to separate them when you think back on a ball game again the hours uh, spent last week the dedication all week long uh, the film watch the days of practice and the night before not being able to rest comfortably finally arriving at the day and fighting so hard for approximately three hours and come away losing it in the closing second has to be uh, total dejection for the for the setters I'm sure you echo these things. When, when I played a game, if the team was a winning team that I played on, you never go back to review the game. But when you lose every single play, you can say, if that hadn't happened, if I had done that, is that the way you felt? How so, how, how so true and uh, well spoken. Well, Pace has now gone over to, to its side of the field to speak around with his coach. They just need a a real pep talk now to keep their spirits up and for the the red men well victory is theirs and they remain undefeated in the liberty conference and it was a real squeaker as they came back farron back got the um, first td from Enterline. johnson a, another pass from Enterline. isa with a 22 yard field goal and pace led 15 to nothing precario came back for st john's with a three-pointer and a 22 yard field goal o'connell a 13 yard pass from coster to cario kick Pace 15, St. John's 10, and then Weisenberger on the pass from Coster. St. John's 16, Pace 15, the pass failed, but St. John's has won at 16 to 15. Bob Wolf, Emerson Boothley here, and now let's go down to Frank Curtali. Frank? Thanks, Bob. I'm here with the winning coach. Coach, back and forth it went, finally stopped in St. John's favor. We're just happy to get out of here with Hard. this win. My God, what a ball game. Uh, are you surprised that he, he went for the field goal when he did on first down about 17 seconds left? Uh, no, they had no more timeouts left. Uh, it was a good call. Didn't have to rush it that way and all. It was the right call, right okay. decision. Uh, you know, great ball game. Both teams, hey, Division Three. what can you say? These kids, this Liberty Conference, they come out of you after each other. Rich Middlebrook, one hell of a football player. Thank God we don't have to see him again. <laughs> when you're down 15-10, you send the troops back on offense. 
first play, bang, the touchdown of Weisenberger. Was that called? Did you send that play in? We called. In fact, we run that same play about six out of the last seven plays prior. It's an option. We put the wide receiver short, and Weisenberger tries to get behind him. And we felt that it was there, and we hit a couple of short sure. ones, and one they knocked down in this corner. So we said, let's try it again. They really haven't stopped it. Let's try it again. And great pass, great catch, and Weisenberger breaks that tackle. Oh. Super play. Coach, good luck uh, next week against a big uh, Kings Point team. I know you don't want to think about that night right yet. Go Let celebrate this. 30 now. Let's wait until 5 o'clock and worry about Kings Point. Let's these kids <laughs> play a hell, of a hell of a comeback. The way they, let's get in there and enjoy it. Okay, we do, all, all, this, all this excitement, we don't have the game ball with us right now, but Coach Rick is definitely going to get it add to his collection on behalf of the Sly Fox and the Wilson football. Congratulations once again, Coach Thank Rick. You, okay, that is Bob Rick of the winning coach. Emerson and Bob Wolf will be back to talk about the offensive, defensive players of the game. You're watching Liberty Conference football on Cablevision. The very second season of Liberty Conference football underway, and Apple Bank back as a sponsor. I know you've got some exciting news ahead. Harry, we're delighted to be back, and we do have exciting news. At Apple Bank, we're introducing the Apple Bank Family Program, which provides low-cost loans, free checking, and great credit card rates. And you'll be hearing and reading a lot about this in weeks to come. Apple Bank for Savings, with five convenient locations on Long Island. Five million square feet of office and industrial space is being built on Long Island. For Long Island's energy company, that translates into increased demand for efficient, reliable service. Lilco is responding by beefing up a service force. Already 100 apprentice line workers are starting the rigorous training. It's a tough program, but to serve Long Island better, that's what's needed. Lilco, working harder than ever to provide energy for a growing Long Island. There are many good reasons to place a pet. Loyalty. And Bidawi has just the program. Involvement. Simply ask for their Place a Pet application. Learning. And take home any pet for 30 days. Fun. If things don't work out, bring them back to our home. Friendship. But it usually works out forever. And your deposit becomes the adoption fee. Security. So for the best of reasons. Love. Call your Bidawi shelter and we'll place a pet. Emerson, we've seen once again. It's not how the game begins, it's how it ends that counts. And boy, that, that was a thriller, didn't it? Indeed it was. It was kind of uh, hit and miss there for two quarters for St. John's. Uh, the, the setters struck the early pace in the second and third quarter, but it was all St. John's coming downhill in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they had it when it counted. Uh, it counted up on that final scoreboard. So we had, uh, well, we had to wrestle with the offensive and defensive players, but, but finally the Apple Bank selection is made and the offensive player the game Jim Weisenberger big tight end 6'3 225 just an outstanding day he only had four catches but those four catches were big catches the fourth catch a 70 yard TD giving St. John's the victory mm -hmm. and of course that'll be the headline Weisenberger does it with that big catch but you've got to salute pace they hung in there and boy what a tough loss and they had one man who was particularly outstanding and here's our Apple Bank defensive player of the game. His name is Don Dignan, and he came up with nine tackles. He had an interception. He tipped ball for an interception, and he uh, also broke up four passes. So he put in a tremendous effort, didn't he? Indeed he did. That entire pace uh, setter defense had an outstanding afternoon. They played extremely well. It showed in the last closing seconds how hard they had fought both offensively and defensively. The emotions were there. The emotions were there. They were there up in the TV booth as well. So at the result of the uh, victory, St. John's remains undefeated in the Liberty Conference, but I'll tell you, Pace gave him some battle. So that's the story, and Emerson Boozer, my thanks to you as usual, and to uh, Frank Cotali, and I'm Bob Wolf. Once again, the final score is St. John's 16 and Pace 15. St. John's will be able to be on TV next week, and St. John's fans will be able to follow their fortunes, as a matter of fact, for the next two weeks of the Redmen on Cablevision. First, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy invades the Redmen field, and then St. John's travels to CW Post to face the Pioneers. So we hope that you'll join us here on Cablevision. Today's Liberty Conference game has been brought to you by Apple Bank for Savings. We're good for you.
And now it's so long from Redmond Field. You're listening to the WBLI Party Line. Requests, dedications, and more exclusively on Long Island's number one party station, WBLI. You got a reputation for me. 